Oh, you're muted. Okay, we're live. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is a meeting of the Joint Standing Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety. It is Monday, May 17th. Um, I'm looking, we have enough to start right now. Um, this is a work session. I am Senator Susan DeChambeau, District 32, and that encompasses Dayton, Lyman, Alfred, Arundel, Kennebell Port, uh, and Biddeford. The purpose of this work session is for the committee to receive information from staff and others in order for members to consider the legislative proposals before them and make recommendations to the legislature. Only committee members, the committee analysts, and those specifically invited to attend will be participating in the work session using Zoom. For members of the public wishing to observe this meeting, it is being live streamed on uh, the committee's YouTube channel and will also be recorded for viewing after this meeting is concluded. Materials will be provided electronically, either uh, through the screen share or emails or anything that we post. Um, when it comes time for the committee to vote, we must have a quorum present, at least seven members, including a senator. In order to be counted as present, your identity must be visually verifiable on the Zoom screen. I will now call on members to introduce themselves and um, I will skip Representative Warren for now and go to Representative Pickett. Good morning, Madam Chair. My name is Dick Pickett. I represent House District 116, the towns of Canton, Dixfield, Hartford, Mexico, and Peru. Thank you. Representative uh, Warren. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. I'm Charlotte Warren, and I represent the city of Hollowell and the towns of Manchester and West Gardner. Thank you. And Senator Seaway. Good morning. I'm Senator Scott Seaway and represent District 16, which covers Waterville, Winslow, Fairfield, Benton, Albion, Clinton, and Unity Township. Thank you. Representative Reckett. Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Lois Reckett. And I represent, <clears throat> excuse me, District 31, which is the ocean end of South Portland. Thank you. And Representative Costain. Good morning, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Dan Costain. I represent District 100, which is part of Etna, Dixmont, Newport, Plymouth, and Corona. Thank you. Representative Fluker. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Bill Pluker. I live in Warren. I represent Warren, Hope, Appleton, and part of Union House District 95. Thank you. Representative Rudnicki. Good morning, Madam Chair. I'm Shelley Rudnicki. I represent House District 108, which is Fairfield, Mercer, and Smithfield, and I am live from the Capitol, and I am still here under protest because we um, adjourned uh, over a month ago. Thank you. Representative Luckner. Good morning, I'm Grayson Luckner. I represent District 37, which is part of Portland, neighborhoods of Libby Town, Rosemont, Rosemont Stroudwater, and Nace's Corner. Thanks. And Representative Morales? Good morning, everyone. My name is Victoria Morales, and I represent House District 33 in South Portland. Thanks. Um, those are our members. I now will introduce um, our policy analyst, Jane Overton and our committee clerk, uh, Deb Fahey. Thank you. Um, so we shall begin and there's, of course, get your pencils and pens ready, an adjustment to the schedule we're gonna be doing. Uh, some people have called us, they have to come first or they have to be last and we've made an adjustment. The first one we're gonna be hearing today is 16, 75, followed by six, oh, excuse me, 967. Third will be 1364. 
fourth will be 1504. Number five is 1454. Number six is 1668. And the last one for the work session is 546. <clears throat> for the listening public, these are work sessions. This is not a public hearing, it's a little different. Once we have looked at these seven work session bills, there are two public hearings this afternoon, 1683 and 1699. Thank you. We shall begin with, um, where is it? 1675, an act to amend certain provision of Maine's drug laws. And this is uh, Representative Rachel Talbot Ross's bill. Um, Ms. Oberton, is there anything we should be aware of? Hi. Uh, well, is uh, the sponsor in the waiting room or? Uh, no, not yet. No. Not yet. Okay. There were a number of other people who you invited to come uh, be present, particularly, uh, I think I'm expecting Meg Elam, uh, Jonathan Sarbeck, uh, maybe yep. DA Maloney. Uh, who else? Maybe Sheriff Morton. Is there anybody? Uh, uh, Chief LaCroix. Okay. Uh, any of those people here? I'd like to defer, first of all, to Representative Warren if she's available. Uh, sorry, Representative Warren. Um, I should have picked up on that also. Um, I don't know whether you want to make a statement on 1675, or I guess we have people in the attendees who had planned to make comment or answer some of our questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would like for the analyst, um, Jane, to sort of walk through what the proposal is. I know we don't have a bill analysis, but just a walk through what is currently proposed, what we heard at the public hearing. We've all got to get our head back in the game this morning. And um, that's the most important thing. And then uh, as far as all of these folks, um, I think the committee decides together who it wants to hear from, and we will do that when we get to that point. Um, do you know so, if, excuse me, do you know if Representative Talbot Ross will be joining us? I would assume she would be. Okay, she's um, not here yet, I don't believe. Okay. Um, we do have Senator Hickman is with us um, as a co-sponsor of the bill. Um, could we start with an analysis, yeah. a walkthrough of what the proposal is? Okay. Um, and I, I just want to say that you re you'll all remember that at the end of Friday, we heard from Attorney General Fry with an amendment, the beginnings of an amendment. So I definitely would like to start off after we hear from Ms. Orbiton um, from Attorney General Fry. But let's have a just a, even a simplistic analysis of what the proposal is. Okay. Uh, well, just back up, uh, you did invite Attorney General Fry and he said that he was not able to come today, uh, but that uh, Meg Elam would be available and would be attending. Uh, the, the bill in section one repeals from the definition of trafficking possessing two grams or more of heroin or 90 or more individual bags, folds, et cetera, containing heroin. Uh, it also repeals from the definition of trafficking, possessing two grams or more of fentanyl powder or more than 90 or more individual bags or packages. Uh, it does the same thing, repeals the same, uh, uh, repeals 200 milligrams 
but less than two grams of heroin and more than 200 milligrams but less than two grams of fentanyl powder from traffic, from furnishing uh, the definitions. Uh, the bill repeals the permissible inference of trafficking uh, for having uh, from for four grams or more of cocaine in or co four grams or more of cocaine in the form of cocaine base. It uh, amends the law on trafficking in cocaine uh, to take out cocaine base in a quantity of 32 grams or more. It takes out of aggravated furnishing, uh, possessing, cocaine base in a quantity of 32 grams or more. Now those are sections one, two, three, four, five uh, at the public hearing, the Prosecutors Association testified that they oppose sections one and two. Uh, the Attorney General uh, uh, testified that he opposed sections one and two, uh, but that those provisions could be moved into permissible inferences of trafficking and furnishing. So it would become an inference as opposed to uh, a specific uh, definition in the uh, definition of trafficking and furnishing. And then with regard to sections three, four, and five, the Prosecutors Association supports three, four, and five, and the AG supports three, and three, four, and five. You had a number of questions outstanding, um, but they were, they were all for, um, pretty much for the, for the prosecutors. Uh, so I don't have anything more for you on that. That's all I have. Ms. Overton, I heard you say the AG supports three, four, and five. I had written down three and five. I wanted to make sure. I think it was three, four, and five. When you mentioned that in the public hearing, I went and looked it up on his written testimony, and it did say three, two, five. So, so three, four, three. And five. <laughs> Yes. All right. All right. We'll find that out. Okay. Thank you. Um, any question of Ms. Overton? Seeing none. Um, well, shall we begin if this um, um, Meg um, Elam is, is available? I see she... Attorney General Fry's name unless somebody else has his link. Okay. Um, Attorney Fry, if you're with us, we'll... Uh, it, thank you. Nice to see you. Good. So you'll be speaking for yourself, right? Great. I, the, no, I, I am here. Uh, so I don't, uh, I guess I'd ask what the, uh, what the uh, best way is to proceed. I, I had made the mistake of thinking that these bills were going to be considered last. And so I had not forwarded a, amended language over to the committee yet uh, as a proposal to be consistent with what I suggested at the public hearing. Um, so I, um, I guess, how can I how can I be informative? Because I can provide some information about a proposed amendment. I can also provide information about what we did over the weekend to try to figure out how to answer the questions that we received on Saturday um, relating to information that relates to to uh, this bill. Thank Attorney you. Fry, I would like to begin and ask if um, I was incorrect because I spoke also based on your testimony, uh, your written testimony. So Ms. Overton is correct then, it's you uh, did not object fully to three, four, and five? It, it okay. is three, four, and five. I should have used a dash to <laughs> three, two, five. That was what the intent was. The, okay, thank you. Madam Chair. Ms. Oberton, yeah, I mean, no, Ms. Warren, yes. Go right ahead. Warren, um, thank you. What I was hoping, um, Senator DeChambeau, was that we could hear an update. I know that 
we aren't ready um, yep. Yep. on this bill. I know that the attorney general and thank you to the attorney general for working on an amendment um, and doing research around that. I appreciate that, but I would like us to start off with an update of where things have moved over the weekend, what you, know, what you are working on, what you're thinking about as an amendment just to sort of level set so we have all have the same information and then we can have a conversation amongst the committee. Thank Madam you. Madam Chair. Yes, I will recognize you, Representative Pickett. Yeah, I, uh, I think if, uh, if, if, if the Attorney General was not prepared with the stuff that can put in front of us right now this morning, thinking it was going to be later in the day, I don't see any reason why we can't just push this aside for the time being, go to the next bill and come back to it when he has that. So I want to see what's in front of us on the screen. And if he's going to be able to provide that, I would rather wait till that to have the conversation. Well, and that's, uh, that, that would be my opinion. The suggestion's a little different from uh, co-chair Warren and I yeah, tend to I know it is. Well, I tend to agree that since he offered, um, Attorney General um, Fry offered to at least bring us up to speed over the weekend. So um, if you're willing to do that, Attorney Fry, uh, we'd love to hear that. Uh, thank you. And I will uh, work to be concise. Um, so first, I uh, just really need a short amount of time. There is some language that would that I that has been put together that would effectuate what I propose that the committee consider, which is removing the, the, the per se definitions from trafficking and furnishing as proposed by the bill, moving them to the appropriate presumptive inference uh, paragraphs underneath the unlawful trafficking, unlawful furnishing statutes, which is where all of the other drugs that are not heroin, not fentanyl, are, are located and, and how they're dealt with for purposes of trafficking and furnishing. Um, there was discussion around whether or not the amounts should stay the same. That is the specified weight and the, the packaged uh, amounts um, did not reach any sort of proposal on that that I have for you, except that um, that is something that I, I know I would appreciate hearing from the committee on, you know, what, what those numbers might be. So my, my amendment moves it, does not include a number, recognizing that, that those numbers, you know, maybe need to be discussed. Secondly, there were some questions that, uh, uh, that Jane had sent along that were asked during the, during the uh, public hearing on Friday. <laughs> I asked my team over the weekend to just take a look at what it is we had how long it would take us to pull it together. And, um, you know, with respect to how many drug trafficking or drug furnishing prosecutions based on quantity or weight of heroin or fentanyl may be brought in a year, we do have some data we could pull together. It may not be complete. We don't have a good tracking system uh, for, for uh, the theory of the trafficking charge that's charged. Uh, we could work through our files to, to, to figure that out, but that would take a little bit of time. Um, and, and so we think that maybe two days, three days, we could, we could have a more sufficient answer to that question. Question number three, how many of those prosecutions result in convictions? How many result in deferral or diversion? What, you know, uh, uh, I think we would need a little bit more information on that. Is the is the interest on what the end conviction is um, by diversion? Is it meant to be drug court or something else? Um, but again, we could look back through our files and, and probably get some data responsive to that within two to three days. Um, with respect to how many prosecutions result in rearrest, may result in death by an offender uh, of an offender. Uh, of an individual, um, we would need to take a look at how many individuals have been prosecuted for specific crimes, pull a criminal records check for those individuals to see if there was any subsequent uh, at criminal activity. Uh, and we'd also have to compare it to the data that we get from the medical examiner's office. 
to determine if anybody has passed. That would take a little bit longer. Uh, we estimated making this a priority would take about a week uh, to do all that. Um, and then in, in terms of cases that have been diverted or, di or, or deferred, um, uh, we probably would have, we'd have to work a little bit pre-COVID, post-COVID. We might have a hard time fully getting a, a, a complete answer on that. We need about a week to figure out how we could answer that as well. So that's the update I have for, for sort of what it is that I understood was going to be asked of us uh, at the work session um, and how much time it, we estimated it would take us to get something meaningful for information. Thank you. Um, I don't know about the week, uh, but um, so that's the presentation from the Attorney General. Um, open it up for any discussion. Um, Representative Reckitt. Oh, you're muted. Thank you. I have a question and I'm not sure who it's for, although I suspect it's partly from to the Attorney General and partly to the, my esteemed colleagues on the committee who have experience in law enforcement. I have utterly no conception of drug amounts. Um, I'm having never dealt with arrests or people or any of that stuff. So I'm looking to those of you who have experience in that arena to give me an idea of what we're talking about here in terms of what's, what's reasonable or unreasonable. Uh, and I literally have no idea. I mean, I'd be looking uh, to, uh, to you, Dick, uh, Representative Pickett and, and uh, Costain, you were also in law enforcement, I believe, and Senator Searway. I really just need some kind of guidance about how I should be thinking about this. And I'm serious, I literally do not know. I mean, you could put in a bill, it could be less than a pound and I would have no idea how many people you could kill with a pound of whatever it is. I mean, I just have no concept. So if you could give me some guidance, I would really appreciate it. Both yeah. from the attorney general and from the law enforcement people on this committee. I have their hands raised, uh, Representative Pickett, Senator Sayway, and Representative Warren. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, well, I had, I do have a statement to make, but I know there's other hands up as well, but I can, in regards to the question that was just made, uh, was just given by Representative Record. Uh, I'm not sure how they came up with the actual amounts in the, in the statute. All I can tell you about amounts of, uh, of, of, for personal use, I don't think you can take a, a brush and sweep it across and make one broad, broad sweep on that. I think there are some people that for personal use, use less, there's some that use more. And, but I can't specifically tell you what a amount is other than what's in the statute. And I'd have to rely upon those people that put the statute Put that figure in the statute together and find out what they used to come up with that figure. It's not much of an answer, but that's really all I have because uh, possession is possession with intent to traffic or furnish. That's a thing that that there has to be more than the amount that a person would normally have themselves to indicate to, to have draw an inference that they would be trafficking or furnishing. And that's the best, the best I can come up with for an answer. Hopefully that somebody else maybe can come up with something more. And I'll save my comment until after the questions are over. Thank you. Thank Senator Shaway. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just wondering if I could, um, I, I was thinking of uh, Representative Ricketts um, request. And I think if we could hear from Chief Jared Mills, who's uh, the current chief and president of the Maine uh, so, uh, Municipal Association, um, they'd have the up-to-date information of what they know. And I think that uh, maybe we could have him come on and, and just speak on it a little bit, if you wouldn't mind. Let me first go to um, Representative Warren. She had her hand up <coughs> in case there are others. <coughs> 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I want to underscore what Representative Reckitt said that, you know, I'm really looking for us to do our good work together as a committee on this bill, which we have proven time and again we can do when we know that um, we're not going to get everything we want out of this bill. I'm not. I come to the table this morning knowing that I'm not gonna get everything I want out of this bill. And I wanna work with you all um, who maybe, you know, have totally different ideas or maybe even today would prefer to kill this bill. I wanna ask that we try to work together to provide some sort of relief to a system that in my view, isn't necessarily working the way we would hope that it that it would be. So I underscore Representative Reckitt's request to lean on the expertise of the current and former law enforcement officers and also the Attorney General. Um, I'm happy to hear from um, Chief Mills. Um, I also know that that's what the Attorney General is doing in his work of researching. He is collecting information from all of the, and maybe this isn't the right term to use, but all of his stakeholders, all of the people that he works with. Um, and I appreciate very much his willingness to help us um, craft something that, you know, hopefully we can all get behind together in a bipartisan way. Um, and again, I know that means that everybody's gonna have to compromise. I also heard from the attorney general that he needs time. Um, I suspect that Representative Pickett at some point is gonna make a motion. So if I could weigh in on that, I would like to suggest that we pick this up again off the table next Monday so that the time that Attorney General Fry has asked for, we afford to him. Um, we have work sessions that day already. So um, that's kind of my current thinking about this process. Thank you. I have um, Representative Castain's hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, my suggestion would be is if uh, Director McKinney's uh, in the audience, which I believe he is, that maybe he could talk uh, intelligently about the the amounts, et cetera, for Representative Pickett. Uh, I'd, I'd much rather let him give a stab at it than myself. So I think uh, if he's there, that he would be a good one to uh, use his knowledge on uh, the amounts uh, as we're asking at some point. Thank you. Uh, Senator Sayway, followed by Representative Pickett. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I guess we can let Representative Pickett talk and then uh, I guess if we can get uh, Chief Mills on after, would that be okay? At your request, um, I shall do that. I'm waiting for now. May I now go to Representative Pickett. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think after, after hearing what the Attorney General's office is uh, trying to get together for information that we've requested in the timeframes, and if this bill is important to us, it's important to try to craft something that we can that we can work together on and come up with some kind of a some kind of a uh, a base and work on, then it needs to have the time to be efficiently done so we can get the st statistics that we really need to get. And I think by just putting it off for a week is a rush rush job. I don't think that's going to be able to happen. It'd probably be able to happen, but it's not going to be complete. And so, I mean this. This statute has been in for quite some time, obviously. So I personally think that the best thing we could do with this bill, if there's gonna be any way at all to be able to craft this into a bill we can all get behind, I think we ought to be considering to carry it over and take it up the first thing, first thing next year. I know it's a few months, but it gives people 
the time to work on it and really come back with something that we can really dig down on and see if we can come to a consensus on and pass through this through this committee. That would be my suggestion. Thank you. It's just suggestion. It's not your motion. Right. It's a suggestion at this time. I'm will. I'm you know. I'm willing to listen to anyone else what they have to say. Representative Warren. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would agree with Representative Pickett if the Attorney General told us that he needed two weeks, but he didn't tell us that. He told us that for most things he needed two days, and for one thing he needed a week. And I'd like to take the Attorney the Attorney General at his word um, and work this bill um, next Monday. I know that he's already he and his team have already been working on this over the weekend, and I also know that. This isn't a bill that we just started. This is a bill that we worked many times last session. And the Attorney General was part of that. And Roy McKinney was part of, excuse me, Director McKinney was part of that. So I would agree with Representative Pickett if, you know, actually the public hearing that we had on Friday was the beginning of this bill, but we all know that it wasn't. And I'd like to take the Attorney General at his word. If he can get us all the information in a week, let's get it off our plate and let's not have it next January when we're going to have a really whole lot of tough bills. So that's my current thinking about it. I have Representative Reckitt. I just really have a kind of a follow up question to my original one, which is as I look at the statute, I think I understand enough to know when these pieces of the statute were enacted. Uh, and lawyers amongst us would tell me if I'm right, but, uh, but the reality is I have no clue where these numbers ever came from. Who did them in the first place? I mean, that's, I'm just sort of a curious about that. And maybe it's a matter of uh, trying to look back at the record in 2015 or uh, 1999, or, but whose idea was it in the first place and based on what? That's the other part of my question may not be answerable, but I really don't understand if they didn't fly from the sky. Somebody uh, put them in as a suggestion initially, and I have no idea who that was or what level of expertise they had. And so that's the other piece of my question, which, um, <clears throat> which might or might not be able to be answered. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I have Senator Sayway followed by Representative Morales. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can we listen to Chief Mills now? I mean, uh, I've let it go. Uh, <laughs> I, I agree with you, Senator Sherway, and I probably should have recognized Representative Morales, who hasn't had a chance to speak first. Okay. Uh, right now, there's more than um, Chief Mills that has been asked to give some testimony or to, to get and, some. Ideas. And while I'm speaking, can I say a few words? Just to. Yeah. Go right ahead. I, I, uh, you know, right now means the safest state in the country. And if we continue weakening our laws, um, we won't be. And uh, there's a reason for that because um, the police are doing a good job. They had 88% uh, poll ta uh, taken out, a uh, poll taken, 88% of the people think that law enforcement is doing a great job and they they hope it continues the way it is. So, um, and that we should be supporting them. And so this is just a, every time we take a little bit of a notch and we weaken it, uh, we're gonna see a difference. And there's gonna be, you know, people harmed out of it more than helped. And so I just want to let everyone know that there's a reason why we're where we are. And Senator, I just- yeah. Senator said, well, that's really close to a speech we would hear right before your vote, but uh, I'd like to continue. Uh, yeah. I, we Thank all you. have an opinion, but also many has still have questions. So yeah. Representative Morales. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just about you know what Representative Pickett was talking about and Representative Warren of how we work this bill. Um, I, f I feel like we are in a groove having heard this bill on Friday um, and 
um, you know, the hearings have been tremendous. And for all those who are listening, I think it is important to note like how much information we've been getting from the community, which has been very helpful on all of this work. Um, but having heard from the attorney general and the work that they're going to be putting in this next week, I would be in favor of, of talking about this and working this bill on Monday, which at, at which time I think if we're not ready, we still have the opportunity to, to carry it over if we all think that we're still not ready. Um, so I would like to have that opportunity to do that together. Um, and again, I, I agree with Representative Reckett that, you know, we really need all of us at the table um, to make this really difficult um, decision. So that would be my, my preference on, on moving forward towards work session on this bill. Thank you. Thank you. I have uh, Senator Lawrence followed by Representative Pickett. And you can introduce Ooh. yourself, please, Senator Lawrence. Thank you very much. And sorry for joining late. I just had a couple of uh, legal things to get concluded this morning. Um, I am uh, State Senator Mark Lawrence from Southern York County, representing the towns of Kittery, York, Agunquit, Elliott, South Berwick, and Berwick. Um, my preference would be to hear back from the Attorney General on Monday. I'm really interested to see what Attorney General uh, Fry has to say. Um, my philosophy on this is that we have to re-examine how we approach prosecutions of, um, of drug offenses from possession to trafficking with the understanding that this has become this crisis has really focused on is hitting the middle class now in Maine, throughout Maine. And we have to look at how we structure things in our criminal statutes and in our, um, in our prosecutions in a way that encourages people who are victims by virtue of possession into rehabilitation and, and still uh, hold accountable those who are true traffickers. So I'm anxious to hear from Attorney General uh, Fry because he heads up the, the department that assigns all the, all the uh, drug prosecutors to the DA's office. So I would like to hear from him on Monday. Thank you, Senator Lawrence. Uh, Representative Pickett. Yes, Madam Chair, I just have a question for, for you. Uh, the reason why I was leaning toward carrying over the bill is because it was my understanding that we were supposed to be done committee on Friday, the 21st. So apparently that goalpost is moved. Yeah. Unbeknownst to me, I have no, I, I was told point blank that it was going to be the 21st. And so now we're having work sessions on Monday and now we're having another, I think that's another work session regarding the government budget change package next week. So that's what's troubling to me when we have a date that we're supposed to be stopping at. And so that's why I said, if we're gonna be, have to be out of here by Friday, to me, carryover was the right way to go. And I still think carryover is the right way to go unless the attorney general says, that he can adequately get the information we need by next week. And if we are going to move the goalpost, if it's been moved into next week, because that's troubling to me, especially not knowing anything about it. Thank you. Um, uh, I could answer that, but I think Representative Warren, you may. Um, Representative Pickett, when, um... When session needed to be canceled last week and rescheduled for this Wednesday, we had all, our entire day scheduled for Wednesday. We had to move that. And in that letter that we all received from Suzanne Gresser is when that date moved um, because of the fact that the 19th, our entire day got wiped out and rescheduled. Um, so that's why it got moved. And I also just want to say, I did send you all of the um, materials. I sent you the calendar. Um, I'm happy to resend that to you, but that's why we had to adjust because we lost a full day on Wednesday. Um, Senator Pickett, 
the rest of the week this week, we have uh, along with session, a total of seven more um, work sessions. And on Monday, the 24th, we have scheduled 10 work sessions. And Tuesday, you are correct, we're having the budget the package. And in the afternoon, we have five more uh, work sessions. And if there's any more bills coming in, you know, uh, we're doing the best we can. So, um, well, thank you for the promotion to senator. I appreciate well, did I that. Call <laughs> senator? Gosh. But uh, uh, thank you for that. <laughs> I don't. Uh, okay, Senator so, Lawrence is laughing. We don't know if that's a promotion, but that's okay. <laughs> so I so I guess then we still don't really have a concrete end date. Am I correct in that? It's kind of a moving goalpost when, when if there, and and I and I and I know that I, I know what Representative Warren is talking about 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 last about having the moving the uh, session date from when it was going to be last week to this week. I I understand that, but uh, anyways, if we do have an end date, it would be kind of nice to know so we can kind of start figuring out what we're going to do from here. Thank you. I think families want to know also, Representative Pickett. Um, Representative Warren. Thank you, Madam Chair. I feel your pain, Representative Pickett. Uh, we wanted to be done on Tuesday. We The calendar that I sent you had us really powering all of our work onto a week from tomorrow and hoping, hoping that would be our last day. Um, now we have found out we've got a couple more bills coming to our committee that we'll receive on Wednesday. So um, in order for that to happen, we're going to try to get those scheduled as quickly as we can for Friday, which is a really fast turnaround, so that we can go with our families or our friends wherever we want for Memorial Day weekend. So I can guarantee you committee will not be meeting on the Friday of Memorial Day weekend. We are gonna to try to finish our work next week, um, which means getting the bills in our hands that we're gonna get on Wednesday and getting them scheduled as quickly as possible. Um, and what is the last date we're thinking of? Thursday or Wednesday, Jane? Do you remember that email you sent? At, at this point, uh, we have, scheduled things for Monday and Tuesday next week, and we were trying not to do Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. So if it would be possible, we were going to try to fit everything into Monday and Tuesday. That's what I'd prefer so that we can be done. Um... Okay, let's um, go back to the subject at hand. I have heard um, carryover table and um, the request to hear from Chief Mills uh, and someone mentioned uh, Mr. McKinney. Uh, what is the pleasure of the group here? If there is not a motion, I will get more test not testimony, opinions. Um, I am looking at Representative Warren and Representative Pickett. If people are ready, I would make a motion um to table this but i don't want to cut off discussion um from other people either but my plan would be to make a motion to table until next monday representative pickett thank you madam chair um uh, well i will be voting no on that motion unless i until i hear from the attorney general to do determine whether or not he feels he can adequately get that information to us by next next week. Uh, so if it's if we're not gonna if we're not gonna hear from the attorney general on that issue, then I will not be able to support a tabling motion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, attorney General Fry, it, it's been asked um, in in discussion. Uh, if you really do have enough time, I think you mentioned 
public safety and a few other people you have to converse with. So um, the ball's in your court. Would you um, feel that you could be ready for Monday? Uh, th thank you for the question. Uh, while I did go off screen to call a member of my team to just confirm that um, regarding the questions that were sent, how many drug trafficking or drug furnishing prosecutions based on quantity or weight, heroin, fentanyl, confident we can have that uh, for the AG's office, right? Um, in terms of our prosecutions that we have this, we can have that for uh, Monday. Um, in terms of how many of those prosecutions resulted in convictions, deferral or diversion, we will have responsive material uh, by Monday. The, the, what I just have a question mark about how complete it's going to be is the question about how many of those prosecutions are followed by eventual rearrest, how many by death of the offender. Um, the only question mark is I don't know how many other reports we have to pull to compare. That was the one that was gonna take, uh, we estimated at about a week. So I just wanna flag that I, I think that we can provide responsive information that will be informative to the committee on that question by Monday. But I do wanna just put that asterisk of, it does depend on our ability to get information from some other sources. And to be clear, that's for the attorney general's office. I'm gonna to have to see what the prosecutors can separately because they they have their own systems but I don't they don't do as much of these cases as we do so I think our information is going to be um, probably more informative uh, anyway so that's the last statement is the, the only thing that's really holding it up that would may take a little longer than a week correct I don't know who asked that question or the reason. I don't think we were asking for that level of detail. That's what I'm questioning. That's, a, that's really turned into something that I don't think we were requesting. So I think what you can get for us, Attorney General Fry, for Monday is more than adequate and we really appreciate it. Perfect. I, I was I made them I, I went by the questions that were sent to me by the analyst. So that's why I was okay. providing the information. That so I someone must have been interested in that and so I go uh, maybe representative uh, Senator Searway, I'm going to go to Representative Morales uh, in case she may have asked for that information. Representative I, I did. Thank you, Senator. Um, I think I did ask um, District Attorney Lynch if she did know how many folks had been prosecuted and then, you know, what were their health outcomes? Did, did they make it? Did they not? But I wasn't intending for that to be, I understand that we know the amount of deaths that we have per week and you know, so that really wasn't a part of the analysis that I was thinking we would do at the work session. But thank you. It was me to make that that, that request. So, and it was, yeah, in questioning um, um, Mary Ann Lee Lynch, right? That's, right. Okay. Um, I feel more so, confident then that I can have some response. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <Monday. Thank> <laughs> Trying to help the attorney general. Okay. Um, Representative Reckett, I saw your name or I, or Pickett, um, someone had their hand up. So again, I'm back to ground zero. Uh, it looks like we could have a motion to table uh, or else do we want to spend the time listening? Um, uh, and, and it's important, Representative Reckett asked about the um, amount of drugs. So um and two names were suggested i am going to turn it over to senator stairway thank you madam chair i'm, I'm going to vote no on the tabling motion because i think it's not going to be ready that, do we, no. we haven't had a tabling motion okay uh, i think that it won't be ready and if we could carry it over i think there'd be more time and i think that that piece that uh, the uh, attorney general was talking about is important, and I'd like to see all all of it kind of be a piece uh, completed before we we just make a decision on this because it is this these are serious drugs they're going to do harm, and if we just make a a, a number and not have complete uh, analysis, then 
we're not doing the job. So I think if we carry it over, we'd be better off. Um, Representative Warren. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I feel like I heard the Attorney General tell us that he would have the information and I'm gonna honor that because I know that when I tell people that I'm able to do a job, I hope that they believe me. Um, and I believe the Attorney General that he's going to be able to. So I make a motion to table until Monday. Is there a second? Uh, second by Representative Reckon. Um, yes, so the motion is tabling uh, um, LD 1575 until next Monday, which is May the 24th. So, roll call. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, is that for a show a of hands? Call. I thought we'd do a show of hands, but you can do a roll call. Okay, let's do a roll call. Um, video on and please unmute for a roll call vote. We're voting to table LD 1675. It's awful. We didn't, it, this wasn't as bad in education as it is. You're not muted. Uh, Representative Warren. Yes. Representative Morales. Yes. Representative Sharp is absent. Representative Luckner. Yes. Representative Pickett. I'll come back to him. Representative Costain. Yes. Representative Rudnicki. No. Representative Newman. Okay. Oh. Come back to Representative Newman. Representative Pluker. Yes. Representative Reckett. Yes. Senator Lawrence. Yes. Senator Searway. No. Senator DeChambeau. Yes. Um, Representative Pickett. Uh, I will vote yes because of the answer that the Attorney General gave. And Representative Newman? He's not here, is he? Um, yeah, his, his screen is on, but... Oh, his screen is on? Yeah. Um, I mean, he's logged in, but he's not here. So that's okay. two no's and nine yes. So the yeses have it. All right. Thank you, um, Attorney General Fry your help and we'll see you again Monday. Thank you. Um, the second one, is everybody all set? Okay. Um, the second one is LD um, six, nine, S, I getting those numbers mixed up, nine, six, seven. An act to uh, make possession of a scheduled drug for personal use a civil penalty. And that is Representative Perry still. Um, Ms. Overton, is there anything you wish to add or remind us that we may have received um, information by mail? Um, I don't have anything new on this bill for you. Uh, Representative Perry did bring to the public hearing a proposed amendment, uh, and there was a fair amount of discussion uh, at the last work session. Uh, I believe she was going to continue to work on the bill and a proposed amendment. Uh, I believe that's what she said in the works in the world last work session. I don't have anything else. All right. <clears throat> Anybody have any questions or wish to invite? Oh, there she is, Representative Perry. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, I will say I've been working with the bill, but I have no new amendments at this time. 
Um, I leave it up to the committee and I'm here uh, to work with you if you desire. Uh, Representative Perry, uh, we're reading so many of these in the last few days. Could you just uh, briefly summarize what your amendment is doing? Um, well, one thing in terms of the evaluation was to have the Department of Health and Human Services uh, actually set up the rules uh, for that. And um, it was, uh, the change in the wording also was not to say if they could not afford the $100, but that it would be uh, an evaluation or the fine. Uh, and I certainly said I was willing to move on the fine as people wanted to. And also um, looking at expertise is to look at uh, definitions uh, if it is needed uh, in terms of what the amounts would be. And I would like to work with you on that. Okay. Uh, Representative Warren. Thank you, Madam Chair. One of the pieces that we had conversation about the last time we talked about this bill was the lack of treatment. And I think um, we all have concerns about that. So I just wanted to bring to the committee's attention a couple of things that have happened um, since that time that are really good news for us. Representative Stearns brought a bill, um, LD 415, which has to do with targeted case management specifically for folks with substance use disorder. That bill got a unanimous report out of HHS as Representative Perry well knows. Um, and, and I do mean unanimous as in everyone on the committee voted to support it. Additionally, Representative Holly Stover has LD 1135 which is also a bill um, about uh, residential and long-term treatment. So exact, and that's also been voted out of the HHS committee with a unanimous ought to pass report. Additionally, as we all saw on Friday, um, the details of the announcement of the federal funds that will be flowing into the state tracking um, to fund additional treatment. So I feel really hopeful around um, there being an increase in treatment funding. The one thing that I think we might see as a fiscal note on this bill is the cost of the assessment. Um, so remember that we're talking about um, about 1,721 individuals. That's the amount of individuals that were charged last year with possession that would instead, if this bill were to go through, be given this assessment. That assessment is a cost of $84 um, each for each assessment. Some of those um, for those folks, some people will be able to have that reimbursed by main care. Some have private insurance so that it wouldn't be a state expense. Um, if every one of those people needed it reimbursed, we would be looking at a fiscal note of about 144,000. So um, I think we'll probably be looking at a fiscal note of around 100,000. Um, and I just wanted to um, let folks know that that is a piece of this bill and that there is additional treatment supported bipartisanly from HHS. Um, so I just wanted to add that information to the table. Thank you. Good information. Representative Morales. Thank you. And just to, to follow up on that with a with a question, I don't believe, and maybe this is probably for Jane, um, but looking at those numbers and how much it would cost to go through the, the, pro, the, the criminal justice process that is not included in terms of savings, right? In a fiscal note, 
So for example, those 1,721, if go through the prosecution um, process, but rather go through the assessment, that is not, there's no way to capture that in a fiscal note, any savings. They don't and generally, the, yeah, generally the answer to that is no, but I, I never, uh, I don't like to presume how fiscal notes will come out. I, I would say that in Representative Perry's draft, it is not, um, it is not clear that the assessment is going to be paid for by the state. And so uh, if that's your intention, uh, you probably should say that. Senator DeChambeau. Yes. Um, sorry. I, I expected you to answer anyway. <laughs> I wanted to. Funny. Okay, if I may. Um, um, Jane, it's already in state law that that health assessment is reimbursable by main care, which is why we don't need to put it in the bill. That already exists. To get a health assessment right now is about $84. And if you are on main care, you can be reimbursed. That's current. Yeah, I'm sorry. I What I was trying to say was it's not clear whether the person has to pay for the health assessment or the state. That's It's already existing law. We don't need, we're going to stay away from framing that because okay. I could go get a health assessment right now today. Any of us could, it already exists. It costs $84. If I was on main care, I could be reimbursed for that. That's what we're seeing as a possible cost. Okay, fine, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Sherway. Are you muted? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think that um, Madam Lynch had spoken how, um, you know, by having a charge doesn't necessarily mean that they get the charge. There's other avenues and, and maybe the civil a penalty might be a, you know, a choice uh, it, for the DA's to go that route, but to get rid of charging for a criminal um, offense really takes away their opportunity to get them into the system uh, for treatment. Um, sometimes civil just isn't enough to put them, to get them incentive to get them treatment. So um, I'm just wondering how this would affect um, the community and and I know um, uh, I still would like to hear from uh, main municipal uh, chiefs to, to find out what what their feeling is about this I mean this is an important law change so if we could listen to Chief Mills and see what their perspective is from this So you have a specific question for Chief Mills? Yes. All right. Uh, Chief Mills, are you with us? <laughs> Raise your hand, we'll let you in. And if anyone has questions for um, the sponsor, really, as to intent and... Um, I just have a process question. I hope that in I hope that Senator Searway, before you're calling people over that haven't that didn't come and testify on the bill, I hope you're asking them first. I don't want us to be putting people on the spot who planned to not weigh in. I think if people were in attendance for a public hearing, that's fair. Um, certainly do whatever you want to do, but if I was just observing a hearing and all of a sudden I was called in, I might be feeling like I was called on the carpet. So I just think we should be careful when they haven't participated in a public hearing. Um, I, I, Jones, uh, yes, 
Yeah. I don't see uh, Chief Mills, but I brought over Natasha Irving, who raised her hand. Uh, we're going to hold off on that just now. Um, I, I really want to focus on what we learned as the amendment. Um, I really, I'm going to save my comments. So um, I'm going to recognize Representative uh, Booker. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just, I'm, I'm very comfortable where with this amendment has ended us up and, uh, and I, it feels like it's, it's brought the treatment into the conversation in a way that I really wanted to see. Um, so I'm gonna move ought to pass as amended just so we have that, that out there on the floor so we know clearly what we're talking about here. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Fluker. There's a motion um, on I hope I heard this right. Ought to pass as amended? Yes. That's right. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And uh, is there a second? I'll second. Uh, Representative Warren? Right? Yes. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Is everybody ready for the motion? Ought to pass as amended. Okay. Representative Pickett, you have your hand up before we're having a vote here. That's correct, I do. I am, I had, uh, I know the motion is on the floor, but I think there's still uh, opportunity for question, I believe in, in the procedure. So therefore, I, uh, I've been trying to work on this bill and I, I, I applaud, uh, Representative uh, Perry for her work on this bill. And we've uh, been, a, been through a couple of things together so far on it. But my, my problem with the bill still remains and I don't know what we do about it. So I wanna throw it out there. I don't, I don't wanna see the possession charge of scheduled drugs become a civil violation. Well, I, again, no, yeah, the, I'm, I'm explaining what I'm, I'm explaining. My, I know, my, but my, Representative Pickett, <laughs> your vote will speak <laughs> volumes, uh, whether you. Approve. Well, I can justify uh, online what my vote is so people know why I'm voting, I believe. Yes. Uh, is that correct or incorrect? I think, Senator, discussion is. Is this is the time for discussion, right? Go mm -hmm. ahead. And and no disrespect to you at all, Senator. That's not I would I did not intend any whatsoever. I just want to make it clear why why I why I, I cannot vote for the bill the way it is. Because I would like to see something, I would have rather saw something like the charge, whatever it was for possession, and then the charge being if the person opted into going into a treatment program, uh, an, an assessment, and then into a treatment program. And then upon the completion of that treatment program, that during that time, that charge would be held. And then if they were successful completion of that, of that treatment, then at that point there, that crime would never see the light of day in a courtroom. That's what, and I believe I've told that to Representative Perry that that's what I would like to see. I want this bill to have a, a, a real chance to pass. I really do. I just think in the framework it's in right now, it may pass through committee. It might even pass on the House floor and on the Senate, but I don't think it, I don't know if it's gonna make it to the to the to the chief executive and what and what's gonna happen there. So I, I'm I'm just saying that because if we could somehow in a maybe maybe uh, Senator Lawrence would uh, with his experience, maybe he can talk to that. But if we could somehow get that piece in there somehow, then I could I could go with this bill and, and have no reservations whatsoever. But the way it's written with that waiver and then even the hundred dollars isn't what's what's bothering me. It's the taking and changing the scheduled drug, possession of scheduled drug to a civil violation, the tool it's taken out of a box, and also the fact that we got to have some reason not only to not only to get them to take that but to have them be accountable for taking that that they're really doing it because they want more help so that's where i fall on this thank you 
Senator Lawrence. Yeah, hi, um, and I, I appreciate your remarks, uh, Representative Pickett. Um, it sounds to me what you're kind of describing is what we call in prosecution a deferred disposition, uh, where we offer a carrot and stick approach, where we say, okay, you follow your treatment programs and this is the positive outcome. If you don't, then this is the negative outcome. And I do understand your perspective. Um, there's a lot of good to come from as you know, one of the judges used to tell me, um, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. But our, our role is to make them very thirsty. And motivating people to deal with their drug addiction is always a, um, always a difficult thing because what's chemically going on in their mind is telling them, don't deal with it, don't deal with it. So, I respect what you're saying, and I'm just wondering and talking, this is, I think, directed both to Representative Perry and Representative Pickett. Um, do you guys think there's worthwhile trying to discuss this? Because it would be good to get a unanimous committee report out of this so we can assure that it gets through the governor's office and, and becomes a policy of the state. So do you think there's an advantage in discussing uh, what, uh, what um, Representative Pickett is discussing, and I'd be willing to sit down with, with whoever and give my perspectives. Is, is that a question that you wish to pose? Yes, it's a question uh, directed at Representative solution. Perry and Representative Pickett. All right, go right ahead. Did you submit, I mean, did you specifically state Perry, the question? Representative Perry, she's saying you can go ahead. Okay. I think, Ann, we're waiting to hear from you. Is that uh, Representative Pickett? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll start up. <laughs> um, I, I'm willing to do something uh, in terms of this. Um, the uh, the difficulty is, and I and I just see some difficulties with this, is uh, required treatment. Then becomes if this is required by the court, does the court pay for this? Is this the time when that becomes the requirement? Um, the other question I have, knowing that addiction, regardless of the hammer is still addiction. And, and I have seen people do really well, have something happen and they fall. It has nothing to do with the hammer over their head. And, and some of the issues around what they're dealing with uh, on that. But I've also found that every person who goes through some form of treatment learns something and gets them closer to recovery. So I'm not convinced the hammer will do it, but I would like to at least see uh, something happen that offers treatment at an earlier level than having to go to court. And uh, so if we can come to an agreement on something, sure. Um, but I think we still need to look at some form of civil penalty with maybe certain amounts. Representative Pickett, you have your hand up. Yeah, I and I I certainly at this point here I I defer to the uh, to the bill sponsor because it's her bill and I know she's worked real hard and I know she's been in this field and she knows this field very well and I respect her immensely because of that. Uh, but it it. I don't know if there's, if, if, I guess I'd leave it up to the Senator, if you think there would be any uh, benefit in trying to work on that, or do you think we're not, probably not gonna get to a position that, because uh, I, I do not wanna see the, the possession of drugs, I do not wanna see that be reduced to a civil violation. I, I can't, I, my caucus will, I will not support that, I know. 
I have Representative Warren followed by Senator Lawrence. Thank you, Madam Chair. I really appreciate where Representative Pickett is, um, is suggesting, but also what's, what's currently being suggested right now already exists. So there would be no policy change there already is the opportunity for deferred disposition. The problem is that it's not equally offered across the state, which is why we feel like we need a policy change. And Representative Pickett, you and I did talk about um, deferred disposition, but we talked about a mandated deferred disposition, which would mean that every prosecutor regardless would have to offer a deferred disposition, which is basically in my mind, the same as a civil, giving a civil instead, right? It's, it's the same goal, not getting someone stuck into the criminal justice system and giving them the opportunity for treatment. So um, I just wanted to add that in that I agree with my good friend, Representative Pickett in his intention, but there's not a policy change there. It already is something that exists, um, unless it was some sort of mandated. So I'll stop there. Senator Lawrence. Thank you, Representative Warren. And I, I see your perspective. I see Representative Pickett's perspective. I think there is value in discussing um, because what's not in the statute now, deferred dispositions already exist, but I don't think what's in the statute now is an alternative that allows a prosecutor to plead out a possession offense as a civil violation, as an alternative. And that's what Representative Perry is getting at. And we can look at ways to encourage prosecutors to do that. Um, and unless things have changed, um, possession of drugs is usually handled through the AG's office, through the drug prosecutors. So there is the chance with the support of the AG to get some uniformity across the state. I think it's worth exploring. And, you know, if, if you could give us till Monday, perhaps, I do have a, a friend who's a retired judge who ran you know, an adult drug court who has, I've called him and asked him if he would be willing to help kind of give me some counsel on how to do some things. And I'd like to pull him into a conversation with Representative Pickett and Representative Perry about he's been both a DA and a, a Superior Court judge. So he sees things from all different perspectives. I would be okay with that, uh, Senator Lawrence. We have a motion on the floor we have to handle. It ought to pass as amended. If it continues uh, and fails, uh, there we floated a- um, We don't need to run that. We could just, if, if people are wanting to give these folks some more time, which I'm happy to do that, we would just make a motion to table and that trumps the motion on the floor. I'm happy to give Senator Lawrence and Representative Pickett and Representative Perry time to work always if folks are working on stuff. I just wanna say that and then we could move that. I wanna see how other people feel about that. I'm gonna recognize Rec Representative Pluka. And just saying if, if the will of the committee is to table, I'm fine with that and happy to withdraw the motion if that's where the direction we're headed here. And Representative Warren also her second. So the motion is withdrawn. I now will recognize uh, Senator Lawrence. I move to table. Move to table. Second. Seconded by uh, Representative Castain. Roll call, please. Roll. I don't know where to keep my notes anymore. My page is too full. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Oh, I think Representative Pickett has, oh, we're gonna do this. Yeah, I think we're unanimous. Can we just do this and see if we're unanimous? Can everyone put your hands up, please, if you agree with tabling? We are all there. 
Good. Um, so the motion was from uh, Senator Lawrence and seconded by, I forgot. Who seconded? Representative Costain. Costain, of course. How could I forget? Thank you. Wow. Thank you. I've been humming going around the mulberry bush for the last half hour, so. <laughs> um, very good. Beautiful background there, um, Representative Perry. Nice picture. Okay, the third item uh, today is LD 1364. That's from Representative Bailey of Gorham, resolved to establish the commission to study and recommend incentives for residential fire sprinkler systems. This is the work session. Um, anyone want to add something to that? Um, Have we received, okay. Uh, could, we bring in the sponsor. could we bring in the sponsor before we start working? Yes, oh, I'm sorry, I thought I, he was here. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Bailey, please raise your hand so we can let you in. There he is. Welcome. Morning. Good morning. Uh, we're going to let uh, our analysts um, make a comment on this and respond, please. Uh, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, this is a commission to study and make re and, and recommend incentives for residential fire sprinkler systems. It's a uh, 16 member committee uh, that involves uh, a lot of different members. Uh, there was some discussion about who would be appropriate members. Uh, there was a discussion about <coughs> insurance agents as opposed to insurance carriers. Uh, and uh, Charlie Silton, who represents insurance carriers, sent you information uh, about uh, the carriers, in fact, suggesting that uh, you substitute carriers for the agents. Uh, and perhaps uh, you could have only one if you wanted only one. Uh, the carriers, he did tell you that the carriers do offer uh, incentives for uh, uh, providing sprinkler systems. Um, there was also a, a, a recommendation that you include a member of uh, a, a one member who was a fire chief, uh, particularly trying to pick up a rural community and uh, there was a suggestion from Representative Underwood that um, the commission look at sprinkler requirements in multi-unit de family developments. That's all I have. Thank you. Um, Representative Bailey, you'd like to add something? Yes, Madam Chair, I, I know that uh, I'm sure Ms. Orberton has been very busy this morning. I did send over a, a potential a, amendment for the, the committee to consider that I think tried to capture uh, many of the uh, uh, suggestions or concerns that were raised uh, during the public hearing. I don't know if uh, she has had a chance to review that, but uh, if she's able to pull that up or even share that on her screen, I think that'd probably be helpful. I'm also happy to very quickly walk through um, the sort of bullet points of those, if that would be helpful. Did you send that to us also as members? I, so I, believe, I, I believe I sent it to uh, the committee analysts and the chairs of the committee. I don't think I sent it to the full committee. So you sent it on the legislative mail, right? That's correct. Yes, ma'am. Okay. We have it. Everybody have it there? Can I we have Jane or Deb screen share it, please, Madam Chair? Yes, thank you. Thank you. 
I don't seem to have it here. Uh, it was at. Jane, could you send no. it to them? So I Jeff just sent it to I just sent it to all of you, including Deb. Thank you. Wow, it's going to take a while to look at this here. So if I, if I may, the, the six sort of bullet points at the overview really just sort of capture the, and, and your, your analysts already sort of bulleted these out. Um, and the below language is simply the, the language that you could insert uh, into the bill. And of course, your legislative analyst can come back on language re review with the, what the, the correct language should be. But um, the first point uh, to be made, Senator DeChambeau had raised the concern about um, the fiscal uh, impact of this, and I did some had some conversations with staff, and it was actually a result of the, the the legislators who serve on the commission because legislators are paid for their participation. And after talking with uh, some staff and stakeholders, it, I don't believe that legislators need to be part of this process, uh, and it, that you could simply bring the experts together to study the issue, and then bring it obviously back to you all as the as the legislators to discuss. And so by removing, uh, striking the legislators from the commission, um, which is actually six of the proposed initial 16 seats, you would uh, remove the bulk of the fiscal note. The only remaining piece would be around the main community college participation, which is a very minor uh, fiscal cost. The second would be uh, to add two representatives from the Maine Fire Chiefs Association. Um, and uh, at the, that was part of the conversation that Representative Newman had pushed back on having a particularly rule representation in this in this conversation, making sure that that was important and, uh, and that the fire professionals, fire service professionals have a, a strong voice. Um, the amendment that was mentioned from your, your analysts uh, from the main association of insurance companies to change insurance agents to insurance carriers is reflected uh, in the below membership. Um, and uh, I also, based on the conversation that Representative Newman had raised the concern about um, uh, making sure that there are that, that the, the commission were to study solutions that may be specific to rural versus urban communities. So I simply added uh, some phrases into the section five duties um, uh, that reflects that desire to have the commission look at, are there differences or similarities between rural or urban solutions for incentives to fire sprinkling to make sure that the, committee, that the commission um, really understands that and reports back to uh, you all on, on that specific issue. Uh, and then uh, the other uh, two are technical pieces. Uh, one is the co-chairs because I, because my amendment would remove the legislators in order to uh, nearly eliminate the fiscal cost. The original bill proposed that the legislatures, the legislators co-chair the commission and given that they are no longer on the commission, it needs new co-chairs. And so that's just a technical change to have the first name fire chief and first name insurance carrier representative chair the commission. Uh, and obviously you could decide to have different people chair. And then the, the final suggestion uh, is uh, to perhaps uh, change the report back date from December 1st to February 15th, um, simply to give the, the vol all volunteer commission more time to evaluate and analyze potential um, incentives and report those back to the legislature. So. Uh, the below language simply reflects those uh, six bulleted points, uh, four of which were discussed at the public hearing, uh, the fifth uh, being a technical change that would be needed, and then the sixth being a suggestion uh, from myself. So thank you. Um, I have a question. I, I want to go back to the second one. You said add two representatives from the main fire chief association i thought that was number four where is it in the original where do we have the fire chiefs in the original bill good, good question and i think that was the concern raised by representative pickett i don't want to speak for him but the original bill rep, uh, included representatives from the association a fire uh, association of professional firefighters, but not from the fire chiefs. And so this, oh, this is two new positions. Yes, it's two. So we're removing six and we're adding two positions. So the total number of commissioners goes from 16 to 12. 
Uh, so it's a smaller to overall commission. I should have I should have mentioned that as well. All right. I, I just want to continue since he um, mentioned my name and I wanted a clarification of what I just asked. Um, really, what I kept uh, I pointed out to is I could not understand why they needed to be appointed by the Speaker of the House of Representatives. Um, I think it's because it's a, a temporary commission or a committee. It's not, I, I, for some reason, unless someone tells me different, um, maybe it doesn't rise to the level of the governor appointing them, but um, we'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, I'll, I'll, if someone doesn't mention it, I've got one other suggestion so, or question, and I'll turn it over to Representative Pickett. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the person I think who um, asked that was not me. I think it was Representative Newman, I believe was the, uh, was the representative, but uh, I've been in touch with him, and he's told, he's told me that he is... Uh, he is okay with the, with the study. And uh, he also, uh, being in the business, he is willing to help in any way that he can with it. Thank you. And if I may, I, uh, Madam Chair, I, I apologize. I was thinking of Representative Newman and looking at Representative Pickett in my screen. So <laughs> I apologize <laughs> to both representatives. I'm gonna reserve my, my comment, my snide remark. Uh, you better. <laughs> Representative Warren, I was just going to say one is very handsome, but like it could be. Uh, Representative Warren. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I appreciate, um, I always appreciate an amendment that sort of addresses all of the issues that you heard, you know, well-founded issues that you heard from the committee. Um, and I think you've done a great job addressing those issues. Um, I would like to make a motion ought to pass as amended. Is there a second? second? That. Okay. Okay. It's been moved and seconded ought to pass as amended. Um, I wish I'd known that. I would have said something beforehand. Uh, Jane Overton. Hi, I'm sorry. I just need to clarify the way the amendment is written. Um, did you mean for uh, sections four and section six of the of the resolve to stay in the resolve, or are they disappearing? No, I was just simply uh, focusing on the sections that we were amending based on the bullets above, and and I am not a lawyer, so I was simply <laughs> trying to take a stab at uh, giving some potential language. Uh, for uh, to assist you and, and the drafters as you're coming back for language review so you could capture my intent. So I okay, hope so you're intending section four and section six of the resolve to stay in the study. Yes, I'm not intending yeah. to change the other sections at all. That's correct. Okay. Uh, yes, Jane? I, I, I do need to caution the sponsor and the committee that uh, this commission that you're fashioning by agreement, it doesn't meet the guidelines for the typical legislative study. So a, um, if, uh, usually you either do the legislative study and you follow the guidelines because frankly, the uh, legislative uh, uh, leadership requires it, or you you direct somebody else to perform the study for you, such and you put somebody in charge of that, such as in this case maybe I don't know the Bureau of Insurance. Uh, in that case, you don't involve the legislature or legislative staff at all. And sections four and six do involve uh, the executive director uh, and um, and legislative council for staff. So you, what you're putting together is kind of a hybrid, 
So I just want you to be aware of that because there may at some point be some questions for you about why you did that and what the implications of that are. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And that pretty much was a question I had. Uh, what I wanted to state before the motion was made, unfortunately, and I thought of it at the hearing and it didn't come out. Um, we've got builders and contractors. We don't have anyone that represents the state, the government. And I keep looking at the main universal uh, MUBEC, main universal building and electrical, uh, what is it, commission or committee? Um, that's who reports to us about electrical and building uh, codes. Uh, code enforcement officers really subscribe to that. Um, this is something that code enforcement officers would be interested in. Uh, I'm a little concerned that the co-chairs, uh, there's no one from the state. It, it's, it probably could be just a group of people meeting. Um, but um, mm. I wonder how the people feel about that, that um, MUBEC probably should be in the discussion. They'll come and testify for or against uh, once we get that report anyways. Um, so I turn it over to Representative Warren, followed by um, Representative Bailey. Thank you, Madam Chair. My first was just a quick reminder to the committee that the only motion that stops discussion is a tabling motion. When somebody makes any other sort of motion, discussion goes on unbridled for as long as we need it to. So just a reminder to the committee um, of that procedurally. Secondly, if, if what Jane is saying is there may be issues with a hybrid, can we give the representative the opportunity and the guidance to fix those issues so they don't slow down this process? Um, and I don't know, Jane, if that's something that you can help him with. I don't know if the pleasure of the committee is we do it here together or maybe you two work together. Um, but I think just saying that there's issues but not giving him an opportunity to fix those issues maybe won't help us move this forward. I had uh, Representative Bailey uh, after uh, Representative Warren, you have your hand down now. Uh, you wish for me to go to Representative Pickett. Please. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I would uh, I would agree with uh, Representative Warren. I think that we could, I, I don't know if it's possible, but possibly where it is ought to pass as amended if we put that those changes as part of the amendment, uh, then that we could still go ahead and make the vote because we won't be changing anything. It'll just be the language and it will be changed to meet the, to meet what we want it to say to put to, to uh, so it doesn't derail this somewhere down the road. That, that would be my suggestion. I'd second that. And Jane, maybe you could work on making those changes and we could look at them as part of the amendment review pro process. Are you saying you uh, are you saying you want the amendment to meet the guidelines or you want to put something together that you and Representative Bailey will advocate with leadership to depart from the guidelines? The former. Meet the guidelines. Yes. And so would they meet the guidelines as in being a legislative study fully or being the kind of say working group that you ask the Bureau of Insurance to convene and then it's really outside of leg legislative study. Do you see what I mean? I defer to the sponsor on that question. I think as far as our committee, it sounds like we support the, we support the, the, the idea and the process and we'd like for the technicalities to be worked out. 
so it's not hung up. So if we could hear from Representative Bailey, I support what, what he'd like to see happen. Madam Chair, could we hear from Representative yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I was thinking it, I wasn't saying it. So Representative Bailey. And, and I, my apologies to the committee that the bill needs a little bit of a cleanup here on the, on the back end, but we'll, we'll get it fixed. And I really appreciate the accommodation. Um, I think the, the former suggestion that the, the commission reflect uh, di various different stakeholders rather than have the executive uh, agency conduct a analysis would be uh, the, the preferable path. Cause I think the, the, the preference here would be to have the various different stakeholders as sort of outlined in the commission uh, come to the table to, to do the work. So if we could uh, align the other sections uh, that um, Mrs. Orbiton suggested uh, are not uh, in alignment with the, the standard procedure as part of that amendment and come back, I guess, on language review, if that's how the committee would review it, um, I'd be glad to work um, with the analysts and others um, to capture that intent. I appreciate it. So Representative uh, Bailey, are you kicking my idea of putting in someone from MUBEC to the curb? From, from where, Senator? Move Sorry. It. From the state, um, um, you know, the main universal building, uh, it's the codes, that's it. Oh. Not commission's code. No, I, if, if, if the committee feels that that is a direction to go, I, another thought that I had during the conversation was, I think perhaps you raised it, Senator, was, the the commit the commission not being co-chaired by people who have uh, formal state roles, and so it seems to me a simple fix there might be to make the the state uh, uh, if 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 the perhaps the state fire marshal himself were a committee member uh, rather than appointing someone else. Obviously, he is a state employee, um, and if the main community uh, college system board of trustees appointed uh, someone who is part of the fire science program, then you'd have two state employees. Um, if, if so, it seems like you could capture that intent within those appointments and make them the co-chairs. Just to, if you're looking for a more formal uh, state employees. To... Okay, I don't want to kick uh, this too much around, but uh, the person who made the motion, uh, shoot, the person uh, was it you, Representative Warren, who made the motion to pass as amended? Um, yes, I did. I, I'd like to, and I see hands, and I'll recognize you, but I don't want to drop Mubek unless all Madam of you Chair, are against it. Um, Madam Chair, the fire, yeah. marshal, the fire marshal is at the table. They are the ones who have Mubek. So Mubek is already part of this um, because Representative Bailey is working very closely with the fire marshal. That's where Mubek is. Well, Thank you for saying that, but that's not the way I see it. So, but that's okay. Oh, well, I don't want to lose well, your- recognize Excuse me, set. Senator. It, yeah. We don't want to lose your support. So if you need us to more um, verbosely put that in there, other than just the inclusion of the fire marshal, um, I was just looking for clarification. How would you like that worded to include Mubeck? I don't know if Representative Bailey is familiar with Mubeck, but this really encompasses in my mind, especially you've got builders, contractors, uh, people who want to install these sprinkler systems and who's going to be investigating this or approving it in the municipalities is the code enforcement officer. And they come in full force when there is a bill having to do with um, these kinds of topics. So, uh, but let me, I've said it enough times, I'm just going to start recognizing some people here. Um, yes, Representative Castain, followed by Representative Bricka. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to make a suggestion, and I, I don't want to stop the uh, conversation that's going on but i think we should table this till friday and have them bring it back to us it's very obvious the bill's not ready to vote on i'm not ready to vote on a bill that uh we haven't seen anything or it's clear and it's not clear there's a motion to table is that a motion 
Yeah, uh, I, I would like to. I'm not going to table yeah, right yet because I don't want to jump on shower. Uh, but uh, but it, this, nobody, I mean, we're not comfortable paper. with. <laughs> yes, I agree. Representative Costain, I was in error. It would have to be someone else who didn't uh, give their reasoning beforehand. So I will. Representative Breckett followed by Representative Warren. I think that um, what I want to say is it's absolutely clear to me and I assume to many others on this committee who have uh, been buried in the Mubeck stuff two years ago and again this year to some extent that it's all controlled by the fire marshal's office and so I think that um, the suggestion whoever made it that the fire marshal be explicitly involved I would say or his designee because he doesn't do that stuff directly it's Rich McCarthy or somebody else in that office who handles all the Mubeck stuff. And uh, <clears throat> I think that it is important as Senator DeChambeau has said that the, the, uh, the uh, requirements and the, uh, for Mubeck, which then fall down to the municipal code enforcement offices is critically important. But I think the best way to do that, and frankly, I would say is to have a co-chair of this group be uh, a designee of the fire marshal who is particularly skilled in Mubeck in for the building code information. Uh, and the um, and somebody suggested the other piece of it that I've now totally forgotten about who it should be, but I don't think the insurance company should co-chair this thing, I have to say. That's my other, my other piece of input. But I think the easiest way to get Mubeck involved and the building uh, inspectors is to have the appropriate designee out of the fire marshal's office. Thank you. Um, Representative Warren. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think that the sponsor has a lot to work with. I think he's heard from us what we'd like to see in the bill. Um, and I agree with Representative Costain to give um, Representative Bailey a chance to put this in writing and bring it back to us on Friday with what he's heard from all of us that we need. So before it gets tabled, could folks add, are there other pieces that are causing you heartburn so that we're not in the same place on Friday? And so that the representative has an opportunity to work on those with Ms. Orbitin. If he comes back with uh, an amendment on Friday, I would like to ask you, Representative Bailey, that you do inquire about those are the initials uh, the main universal building and electrical code. Um, it's under public safety. Um, the uh, fire marshal could probably uh, direct you also. Uh, that's my concern. Um, Representative Costain, you have your hand up. I make a motion this bill gets tabled. Seconded. It's been moved and seconded to table. Uh, we probably should, uh, well, is everybody in favor of that? Uh, raise your hand. Okay, so it's a unanimous vote to table this till Friday uh, when we will be able to look at the amendment um, and do some more tweaking to make it legal. <laughs> Or if I don't know, that's the right answer as far as uh, not legality, but all right. Senator, Senator uh, ex yes. ex excuse me. I just want to clarify that what you're asking me to do is to work with Representative Bailey to come up with a, 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 a proposal for a commission that meets the guidelines. Beautiful. Right. Yeah. Okay. And, I will, I will start off by making sure that he has a copy of the guidelines. Thank yeah. you, and I'm happy to work with him. <laughs> Ms. Obert right. just gave you some homework, Representative Bailey. <laughs> Great, happy to do it, and I appreciate okay. the opportunity to come back. Thank you. It's a heck of a learning curve, that's good. All right, so we have concluded 1364. It's I gotta write it down that it's coming in Friday. All right, right here. Yeah.
So um, that's 1364. I'm now up to 1505. Um, and that's Representative Gramlich, an act to enhance use of critical incident stress management teams for firefighters. Ms. Overton, is there anything you wish to present? Uh, no, the only thing that you had on this was you had asked Representative Gramlich to bring you information on fire departments that have critical incident stress management teams. Oh. Um, is uh, a sponsor here? Oh, Representative Warren, I recognize you. Thank you, Madam Chair. The sponsor is on her way. Um, she has continued to work on this bill since she was here with us and she's going to ask for a carryover on this bill. She is working with the fire marshal, et cetera, but she's on her way right now to update us on the work she's been doing. Okay. You're looking for her, Ms. Faye, when she comes in? Thank you. Madam Chair, Representative Rudnicki has her hand up. Oh, didn't see it, sorry. Representative Rudnicki. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, if the sponsor is going to ask for a carryover anyway, why don't we just move to carry it over and move on? Representative, the sponsor asked for the courtesy of being able to update us with the work that she's doing. Um, I think it'll just be a second or two. I'd like to afford her that, that courtesy. Okay. Does someone know when we're going to see 1675? Is that right. Friday also? No, it, no, it's Monday. Next Both Monday? The, yeah, it was Monday, yeah. That was the one where the Attorney General uh, yep. raised his hand, crossed his heart, and hoped to die that he would have okay. any of our as we used to say on the, in the neighborhood. Representative Gremlick is here. I'll bring her over. Good morning, Representative Gremlick. Good morning, Senator. How are you? Oh, we're just ducky. Uh, <laughs> I have such good fortune of spending so much time with you all in the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. Well, you, you're going to enjoy yourself, I'm sure. Um, we have your bill before us. And um, so my question to you, you wish to update us what you've been doing. And it doesn't sound like we're completely over it. So let's let's hear from you. Absolutely. Um, 
So I had a, a rather productive meeting with some stakeholders last week, including uh, Joe Thomas from the fire marshal's office, as well as Michael Cross from Kraus, pardon me, from the professional firefighters of Maine, and one of the lead clinicians. Uh, Amy Devonport Bacon, who has been instrumental in providing behavioral health care services for our first responders and our firefighters for uh, nearly two decades. And one of the things that uh, we talked about is we have a real opportunity to develop a, uh, a statewide system that can really be effective in assuring that not only just members of the professional firefighters of Maine, but firefighters statewide will be able to have their needs met from a behavioral health care perspective, not only when there are acute um, experiences that folks are exposed to, but certainly over the long term in terms of chronic behavioral health care, particularly post-traumatic stress disorder. And so we are respectfully requesting that the committee consider carrying this bill over as we really feel it's important to have an opportunity to do this right and engage with other stakeholders. Um, presently, uh, Emergency Management System and MEMA are a couple of folks that we would definitely wanna have conversation with. There, there presently is some infrastructure in place through EMS. Um, so we wouldn't wanna to have to necessarily replicate that, but we would love to be able to take some time to have some deliberate conversations so that we can assure that we have a proper system in place that meets the needs of our firefighters and also that we have um, ample opportunity to provide training for clinicians because we know that the um, behavioral health care needs of firefighters are really unique and nuanced comparatively speaking. And I know that, um, I believe, I don't know, I believe that um, Michael Krauss is uh, here in your waiting room as well as Joe Thomas, um, and they they certainly um, can jump in if the committee sees fit for them to do so. As a matter of fact, um, Joe Thomas was, um, during our conversations, uh, actually recommended that we explore um, looking at uh, Title 37, which is the main mutual aid um, statute that could really help to bridge some of these initiatives. Thank you. I, I have um, Representative Castain. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Representative Gremlin, for being here. I have a question from a constituent of mine that's, uh, and he says he believes this is a great concept. However, how is it going to be monitored and how are you going to make sure that the departments are complying with it? And the second part was, he said that he believes it's an unpaid, unfunded municipal mandate. Can you answer those questions, please? Thank you for the question, Representative. Um, in terms of um, you know, how this is going to be implemented and monitored, that is precisely why we are requesting this bill to be carried over because we are cognizant that those are areas that we, like I said, initially, we wanna make sure that we're doing this and we're doing it right. Um, because we know the need is really significant for our firefighters and our first responders. Um, the second part of your question in terms of um, an unfunded municipal mandate, again, I'm, I'm confident that um, having stakeholders come to the table to really tease this out and make sure that we're doing it right, we, are, we will be in a position to address that as well. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Given what you're saying, Representative Gramlich, it it's, doesn't sound, and this is all good stuff, and I'm glad you brought up the clinician role in that. That's a whole different area that needs to fit in there somewhere. And I did mention to you, and I'm sure they'll mention to you again, the role of the, you know, couple of hundred years of chaplains or pastors, um, they have a role to play. Um, so uh, having said that, it sounds like um, we would need more than a tabling motion. Um, have you, is that what you entertain? Would you need more time than a week? Uh, uh, absolutely. Okay, all right. Um, uh Representative Warren. Um, yeah, I will. Representative Warren. Madam Chair, as we discussed previously, the representative is asking for a carryover on this bill to work with all of the stakeholders. Yep. So I would I'll make a motion carryover. 
Okay. I'll second. So, Representative Warren has made a motion to carry over and seconded by Representative Castain. We can have, um, are we all in favor of this? You can raise your hand. If it's unanimous, we forego the, all right. It's unanimous to carry this over. And this is 1454. It's LB 1504, Senator. Oh, wait a minute. You're right. I just pushed it. 1504. Good. Oh, we may carry over the next one. Who knows? No. <laughs> mm -mm. Thank, Thank you. you. That Thank motion you. was Warren. Thank you, Senator DeChambeau. Thank you, Representative Warren and members of the committee. I, I look forward to working with stakeholders and with you all moving forward. I'm really excited that we're gonna be in a position to, um, to, to do something a little bit more deliberate in addressing our behavioral health care needs of our firefighters. So thank you very much for your consideration and your sound deliberation on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Have fun. I'm going back over to ENR. <laughs> Have fun. Okay. I'm now looking at LD 1454 that is uh, presented by, um, we had a presentation by Representative Zega, an act to prohibit untraceable and undetectable firearms. Do and we do have to bring the sponsor in? Ms. Overton, is there anything you wish to share with us? Um, no, thank you. <laughs> that was easy. I'll do that then for her. Um, as we left this bill the last time, we had a discussion and the sponsor of the bill shared with us that he was going to do some work and bring some information back to us. And Representative Zagar is here. May we hear from Representative Zagar first to bring the information that, that he has for us? Welcome, Representative Zagar. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I really appreciate the committee's work. Shall I, shall I, uh, I, yes, I share? With... Go right ahead, please. Terrific. Um, well, thank you. Um, one of the things that, that came up uh, when we had the last work session a week and a half or so ago was um, how clear it was whether um, a, a hobbyist um, uh, private firearm manufacturer could 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 do so. Um, uh, and so I, I think that the, there, and there was some confusion about the language, um, ad admittedly so. So um, I've been working with um, the uh, some um, drafters and, and uh, legal minds um, and have sent a uh, two line uh, amendment that would essentially add a, a, uh, an item seven to um, um, page three on line 19, uh, just to make it very clear that um, this, this bill would not outlaw um, people who are say, uh, receive a, uh, a, a gun kit in the mail, um, as long as one of the three things, uh, following things is, um, is true that it's the firearm is either permanently inoperable, uh, like um, some some kits are, or it's an antique as defined in uh, U.S. statute, U U.S. federal statute, or it it was manufactured before uh, the 1968 Gun Control Act became effective. Um, the other thing that I would bring to the committee is um, is um, uh, the. The, the the there was there was discussion about um, what you know how somebody would receive a um, an unserialized frame or receiver and serialize it if they wanted to um, comply with with such a provision. Um, the the uh, um, current uh, um, guidance or proposed rule from the ATF uh, actually would make it so that uh, it would be. Uh, in order for the, the the kit to be allowed to go over state lines, um, it would have to already have the serial number on it. 
Um, so, it, and, it, and this is a, set, a technical change at the federal level of defining what a firearm is. I won't get into that now unless, unless uh, people w would like to go into that, that, uh, that question. Uh, but that's, that's another avenue or another, another aspect uh, that, that relates to, to this discussion the committee was having a week and a half ago. So, so I would propose um, that, that this bill could advance um, uh, with the addition of that subsection seven that, uh, that I sent. Uh, I'm not sure if the committee has had, had that uh, it, uh, forwarded um, to everyone, if everyone's had a chance to look at it. Deb, is that something you can share, you can screen share? Um, or Jane, did you send that to Deb? I'm looking. I, I don't have it. I, I sent it um, to the, um, maybe an hour or two ago to the uh, CJPS um account okay i yeah i see the email hang on a sec thank you so much i appreciate it deb So this, as, as I said, um, essentially just makes uh, makes uh, crystal clear that if somebody um, is, you know, has either some a firearm kit um, or, or um, is man making at home that's permanently inoperable, or it's a uh, an antique, or it was uh, produced um, manufactured before 1968, um, this this bill would not touch that. Uh, it's all set. Um, okay, so we have that. I mean, I'm my printer's not working, so I'll I'll take a look at it. Um, Representative Reckett. Yes, I just have a question. I didn't uh, totally follow the second part of what you were saying, Representative Zager. Uh, not about those three items, which I do see and saw, I mean, heard and saw. It's the second thing you said. Uh, could you repeat that? Um, sure. Um, I appreciate the question, Representative Ruckett. Um, this, this goes back to what is, what is a firearm? Um, and, and that is defined in, in federal statute currently um, as uh, one can make something so-called 80% um, receiver, uh, so that it, it has the ability, uh, or nearly has the ability to, um, to, to act as the, you know, essentially the fire control system, um, integrated fire control system. Um, I, the only reason why it's not totally current, uh, uh, um, is that it requires three boreholes, uh, to be d done, which is kind of a, a simple process, three, literally three, um, at home, do it yourself, holes must be drilled and then it's fully functional. So um, because currently that kit is not a firearm under that definition, um, it doesn't have to be serialized. And so um, in order to uh, prevent um, a dangerous proliferation of uh, untraceable firearms, um, this bill was was uh, you know, was attempting to make sure that that Maine um, home craftsmen could uh, could uh, could legally um, um, lawfully um, do that and but would have to serialize it, which is very complicated. What is different now is that this exact this proposed rule twenty twenty one R dash zero five is um, would would say that something that is um, has has any of those components. Um, and it uh, is um, at a stage where it can readily be completed, assembled, converted, or restored to a functional state. In other words, those three holes, um, it is a frame or receiver and therefore would, or would need to be serialized in order to, uh, because it's now a, now a firearm, um, 
it recognizes a firearm under federal law. So if I could ask for just a tiny yes, clarification, so are, you, are, we, are you saying that the manufacturer of those kits has to serialize them? That's correct. The, all right, that's, I couldn't, that's the piece I didn't get. And, and therefore the, the, the other provisions that, that we were discussing previously um, would not be necessary. But I should add that that is a proposed rule that still has to go through the uh, public comment period. Um, there's certainly going to be court challenges. And so um, I, I, it's not the case yet that, 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 that uh, those, the, the actual you know, manufacturers and those who are sending the kit would have um, serialized it. Um, and so we could um, in Maine certainly make that um, a requirement um, you know, as in statute. Um, even in the absence um, of, of the, uh, um, the um, proposed rule. So it's a federal rule. It's a federal rule, proposed rule, yes. I have Representative Norales followed by Representative Pickett. Thanks, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Zager. So I think I'm understanding it um, now. It's, it seems very clear that your suggest your your bill does not address the serial number. Um, and, um, but it does say that if a gun kit is in Maine, it must, e it, it, um, it can be used as long as it's not operable, as long as it's an antique and, and as long as it was manufactured before 1968 of the act. And we're not gonna address the serialization because that's being addressed at the federal level, you, we believe. Is that what your bill is? That's 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 my bill. That's I would I would call that Plan A. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you, you Representative Morales. Appreciate that clarification. Uh, Representative Pickett. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Zager, for being here. Question: Undetectable firearms. We heard quite a bit about them the other day uh, about uh, being able to bring them in through a security, not being detected and that kind of stuff like that, which is obviously the, a concern. But what I'd like to ask is I'd like to ask the question if you are, if you have the answer to it, we got a definition of, of uh, what a undetectable firearm is, but can you tell me what that undetectable firearm is made of so that it won't be detected in a security uh, uh, place? Uh, the, the federal statute. Uh, thank you, very Representative Pickett. I, I, I appreciate that, uh, that 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 good question. Um, so the, the federal law requires some. There's something known as a security exemplar, um, which is it's kind of like the, the gold standard, if you will, for uh, anything um, that is uh, more detectable. It, it, something has to be more detectable than than that, um, and that has to do with a, a minimum amount of of uh, metal, I suppose, um, uh, and um, but essentially, if something is plastic, it will not be detectable. And that is a key provision, a, a key aspect of this bill. Um, there's two, two aspects. One is more the serialization. The other is more the plastics um, material. That could be, you know, e either one of those um, could be uh, um, uh, advanced by, by this committee, I think, uh, because both... Uh, I think represent a, a threat to um, to public safety. But but the the plastic that you're talking about, even to make the stock or whatever out of the plastic, would still the metal barrel. The metal barrel would still be would would still be able to be detected uh, on it. So what I'm getting at is if it's if it doesn't have any metal on it that can be detected, and the barrel is not detect is not detectable then what is it going to fire for a projectile? How's it going to well, fire a lead projectile? Well, one, one, can, one can make the, the barrel out of plastic. Uh, there, there are, um, you can, you, they, they, there already exists, uh, given current tech, um, technology, the ability to, um, to, to have an entirely plastic firearm. Um, the only thing is, is, a, is you go to the hardware store and get a, you know, a nail um, to act as the firing pin. Um, and so um, one could make a, a weapon out of plastic, um, bring it through security. Someone else, somebody else, an accomplice could bring the, you know, the firearm, the, 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 the metal piece 
separately. Um, and, 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 uh, and you've got a firearm that, that got through security. Okay. I, I hear what you're saying, but I, I, uh, I just don't see how a, a lead projectile can be shot through a, through a, uh, plastic barrel. Uh, because of the heat and stuff that's involved with it, and if it was going to be something other than a other than a lead a lead bullet or some type of a bullet projectile like that, then it probably wouldn't be classified as a firearm. It might be a dangerous weapon, but it wouldn't be classified as a firearm. I think there is a difference between the two. So, anyways, that being said, thank you very much for your for your answer, sir. I appreciate that, um, Representative Pickett, and. Um... And I, I would just, uh, you know, encourage the committee members to just go to YouTube and and see videos of, of this um, occurring. Um, but I, I, I recognize that it's it seems uh, counterintuitive, um, but um, it, it, it's occurring. Uh, any questions uh, for the representative and Representative Morales? Yes, um, if we're going to end our discussion, I will move ought to pass as amended. However, folks want to continue discussing, um, I'm fine with that as well. I'll second. Well, the motion was made, is there a second? I'll second. Any discussion on that? Seeing none, there will be a vote. Um, Jane oh. has her hand up, and before oh. we vote, I'm going to call for a break. I just yes. wanted to confirm that the um, the the bill that you're voting on is amended. It's the bill plus the amendment that Representative Zager brought this morning, right? That's the only change. That's Thank right, you. and I'll just ask the representative just to confirm that that is indeed what he intends for today. Yes. Yes, Jane. Yes. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. And it's been seconded. Um, Representative Warren, oh, Representative Morales, you still have your hand up? You don't have a question? Okay. Representative Warren, did you? I, I would I, go ahead. I would like to call for a break and I sent out a link for a corner caucus to everybody on the list. I didn't get that one. I never know how to say <laughs> it right. I knew you were going to get me on that. <laughs> so please, those who want to join me over there. <laughs> Thank you. OK.
Are most people back? Yeah. It's just that the YouTube thing is in front of us, you know, the the uh, break message is in the screen. Okay. There we are. <coughs> um, let me see if Oh, Deb, could do you mind resending the link to Senator DeChambeau? Sure. Thank you. While we're while we're waiting, uh, Representative uh, Warren, uh, there's been somebody in the waiting room for the work session, and I believe we did. I think, think we did ask him. I think I might have asked him to be here for the, for the work session. Um, Mark Catron is the gentleman you might remember that actually makes some of these weapons, and right. uh, so so he had a couple of uh, a couple of things he. Uh, would have would like to be able to say regarding the conversation I had with uh, Representative Zager, so I, I thought it might be good to have him on. It's it's just he just wanted to straight uh, to to talk about a couple of issues there and kind of lay it out there where he does it all the time. Great, I'm totally open. Let's move for Senator DeChambeau. Yep. yep. I'm open for him to answer the questions that we have. Yep. I'm not open for uh, retestifying. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Um, let's see, I'll call Senator DeChambeau. Okay, she wants us to go ahead um, and she'll join us. So yes, let's bring in Deb. Could we bring in Mr. Cotrone to, um, share with us some information, thank you. One moment. I think it would be funny to tell her we're all done when she comes in. Good morning, Mr. Katroin. Thank you for joining us. You had something you wanted to answer? Um, one, I want to correct something very explicit that Representative Zager very much got wrong when he was describing the process of finishing in, you know, 80% lower receiver. Um, the, he was answering a question. I forget who asked it, and he okay, answered good. it wrong. Um, Okay, well, do you have information you're going to share? Please share it. Okay. Um, he, Thank do you. you mind if I show you an 80% lower receiver? Because I actually do um, have one. Yeah, we don't allow any props. So how about oh, yeah. you I, just... I can describe it to the best of my ability. Um, clearly, I'm not sure if... I don't think any single person here has ever actually handled one or worked with one <laughs> before. Um, that's always my ass, but that's fine. Um, he said that all it takes is drilling three holes and that finishes the receiver. That's entirely false. That I don't even know what else to say about that. It requires much more work than that. It requires actual milling out the fire control pocket of the receiver, which is a much more tricky, tedious process that requires more tools than just a simple hand drill or drill press. Okay. 
Okay, so your contribution is that the information we've heard was false. Yeah, very much so, yes. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kutroin, for, yeah, for joining us. Um, Representative Pickett. Yeah, I have, a, I have a question for Mr. Coitron, and uh, that is, you heard, my, you heard my question to the representative, so I will, I will ask you the same thing. Uh, on an undetectable firearm, what are they, what are they made of so they're un, undetectable, and what kind of a projectile do, do, they, do they fire? There's only one firearm that comes even close to meeting those meeting that definition of undetectable, even though this law has been in, in existence, I think since 80, 1988, but I could be wrong about that. But anyways, um, that would be the Liberator pistol, um, which is entirely 3D printed and does use a nail for a firing pin. Um, you could theoretically make that one without any, without any uh, required metal. Uh, it uses a chunk of steel in the frame that you could omit and modify design to not use. Um, that part makes it detectable via x-ray and uh, metal detectors. It, is, it, would, it would be illegal for you to make it without that, but there's only one firearm that could theoretically be made with a plastic barrel. Um, I think it fires a 380 ACP cartridge, which is you know very low, low pressure, you know, uh, 38 caliber projectile. And uh, even then, you you would be very very lucky if you were able to get one shot out of it without it exploding. It can be done, but not by your average layperson. It would require a lot of work and post processing of the printed barrel. Thank and you you won't, you won't be able to use regular polylactic acid filament to make the barrel either. You have to use something very strong. Um, I think nylon is generally what people try to use for it. Thank you Thank very you. much for your contr contribution, sir. Thank you, Mr. Coitron. Pronounce your name for me, sir. Uh, Catrone. Catrone. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Catrone, yeah. for the information. Thank you. Thank Deb, you. could you also bring in Mr. Bickford? Yes, one moment. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Bickford. You're on mute. Do you have any um, wisdom to share with us about the questions that were just asked about traceability, untraceability, 80%, um, mm -hmm. et cetera? Thank sure. you. Sure. I think the, the thing that's most important to note here is that there are, uh, if you go on YouTube, if you go on some of these websites that um, that allow for you or for, that, that um, promote the 3D printing of weapons for various purposes. Uh, the, it, it's clear that uh, you can start make the parts and assemble them with printers as low as two or $300. Um, that uh, this is something that the technology has increased or improved uh, by leaps and bounds in a very short amount of time. The tolerances uh, in terms of how well constructed the firearms can be and put together uh, has increased. Uh, and it's, uh, there was the original Liberator that the other gentleman mentioned uh, that was kind of a single shot, a very bulky thing that kind of looked like a Nerf gun. But uh, there's many examples online of uh, fully functioning uh, weapons um, that can be entirely molded out of plastic uh, and are thus undetectable. Uh, and it's important to note these shoot uh, bullets, right? I know that Representative Pickett has, has had some question about uh, what the uh, what they would shoot. They would shoot bullets. There are AR-15 replicants that fire a 223 caliber. And I'll certainly note that uh, even as the other gentleman noted, 380 caliber, uh, it's uh, you know it's not 50 cal, that's for sure. But a 380 caliber uh, firearm pistol uh, is is uh, more than sufficient uh, to kill someone and do very significant damage. Um, so I, I think this is, it is a threat now, uh, and that it, it will just continue to grow in exponentiality in terms of how much of a threat it is as the technology improves and the, um, 
the economics of scale go uh, continue to drive the prices down both on the raw material and on the printers. Thank you. Okay, so we've gathered some information. Unless folks have questions, I'm going to have our guests moved back over. Representative Pickett. I have a question for Mr. Bickford. Mr. Bickford, uh, how many how many weapons have you uh, made? Untraceable weapons have you made? I will say I have uh, not had the privilege <laughs> of making an untraceable weapon. My father's an antique firearm restorer. I spent the entirety of my childhood and well into my 30s restoring and replacing parts on World War I and World War II weapons. Uh, I'm a gun owner. I uh, do a fair amount of re refurbishing and reloading. So I'm very familiar with the process. And I, this is an issue I've studied very closely, both as a part of my work with Maine Gun Safety Coalition and also as a firearm hobbyist. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, with my, you know, I would say quasi expertise in the uh, repair and refurbishment uh, and manufacture, home manufacture of firearms. Uh, follow up, Madam Chair. Yes, please. Uh, have you, have you ever seen, held, possessed a weapon that was uh, an undetectable weapon like this so that you have personal knowledge of it? Yes. No, I've never, I've never held one. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you both for uh, being here. Deb, if you would move our guests back out um, into the attendee list, we'd appreciate that. Will do. Um, so we have a motion on the floor, which is ought to pass as amended. Any more discussion on the motion on the floor? Anyone feel like they need more information before you can take a vote? Okay, we'll have Deb call the roll. A video on and please unmute for a roll call vote. We're voting on LD 1454, first, the first, motion yeah. ought to pass. <clears throat> Representative Warren. Yes. Representative Morales. Yes. Representative Sharp is absent. Representative Luckner. Yes. Representative Pickett. No. Representative Costain. No. Representative Rudnicki. No. Representative Newman. No. Representative Pluker. No. Representative Reckett. Yes. Senator Lawrence. He, he's not on right now. Senator Searway. No. Senator DeChambeau. Yes. That's five yes, two no, I mean, sorry, six no and two absent. Thank you, Deb. Okay, well, we worked through. Okay, Jane, you need to know if theirs is a not not to pass. Yes, yeah. yeah, thank you. Members well, who- Well, since we've got the six five right now, but we don't know it's how it's gonna go, but if we, uh, if we end up, we, whatever, whatever it is for us is gonna be a not not to pass. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, let's take a lunch break and then come back and deal with our final two bills before our public hearings. Um, so plan to come back at 1230. Madam Chair. Yes, Representative. Uh, could we either work a little bit uh, longer or could we, because uh, I we've got something going as a caucus at 12:30 that we're going to all be at and not able to be in in committee. It'll probably take from 12:30 till one. So if you wanted to, if you wanted to do work a little more on what we're doing right now, we can do that, or we just won't we won't be able to be be here between 12:30 and one. Okay. Um, 
Senator DeChambeau, what's your yeah. pleasure? I've, I'm well, balancing a lot of people's needs right now. Yeah. So. That's what I would like to know, Representative Pickett. You have a meeting scheduled at 1230 to last till how long? I'm, I don't know if it'll last till one or not, but I'm, it starts at 1230. It's a press conference we're going to. Um, it, uh, it's really difficult right now uh, to say that uh, because uh, I anticipate that both those bills um, will take some time. Uh, I would hate to shortchange one representative that, that we would stop at 1230 and then you won't have time to have lunch yourself. So it's either, well, really one o'clock is a little over an hour anyways. Oh, so can we say we'll start at one? I don't know. Um, I defer to- well, Why don't we do this? Why don't we do this? Uh, we'll just take the lunch hour, whatever it is you want to do. And then uh, those uh, in my caucus uh, that, will, that are going to will stay in here. If they do, I don't know. It was my understanding that we're all going to be at the press conference. If not, if there's anybody here, they'll be in here. And if not, when we get back, we'll catch up. And if there's been any votes taken, we'll take our votes. I don't think you'll lose anything. It might be a while. Um, I'd like Oh, I'm sorry. I'm talking like I have the cattle. I'm not going to say anymore. Representative, I'm just wondering whether either of the public hearing people are here, and we could uh, dispatch one of those. But I have no idea whether there's a crowd or no crowd. Um, we can't start a public hearing before an advertised time, so that no. is a rule. Oh, okay. um, yeah. Um, so. If maybe we keep working for a little bit, um, Senator DeChambeau. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, frankly, I've already had some inquiries and I took it upon myself to say it sounds, it looks more like we'll meet after lunch. Again, I did not think we would do half. It might be a little longer. So right now, the more we talk, the closer we get to noontime and one hour for lunch. Well, let me and, offer something. Um, yeah. The last two bills are Long Creek bills, and we are hearing from the commissioner tomorrow about the budget, and there is a significant proposal in the change package. So why don't we just not pick up the Long Creek bills today and come back at one o'clock? That sounds like a very good suggestion in that whatever we hear today might be tweaked a little bit tomorrow or change our minds tomorrow, given what we're gonna be listening to. Um, Madam Chair, I didn't, I didn't catch all of what Representative Warren said. I heard her say something about Long Creek. I didn't catch it all. In order to try to meet everybody's needs today and in light of the fact that Tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., we're going to be receiving an update from the Commissioner of the Department of Corrections about the change package having to do with Long Creek. I suggest we don't take up the Long Creek bills today, which are the last two on our work schedule, work session schedule, and we come back at one for the public hearings, and we take those up another day. And would we take those up uh, after the uh, work session on Tuesday tomorrow? We could work them tomorrow. I can't remember how many bills we put into. No, we have public. Do we have public hearings tomorrow afternoon? We may One. have to add them to another day. We got um, two part. You got two work sessions in the afternoon and one public hearing. Okay, we could do them tomorrow. We could start working them tomorrow. I'm, I'm fine with that. Good. Thank you. And I just, you know, I hope that we can all be patient of each other's needs as we are today. Um, that we want to really respect that you all have a press conference and, and we want to make you able to do that. 
and we're going to ask for similar patients with our schedules as they come up. Um, and so you won't have a problem with us on that. Thank you. Um, okay, so let's come back at one o'clock for our public hearings. Yep. Thank you.
Representative Rickett, it's really uh, cold out, I mean, hot, really hot out there. <laughs> Must be 80 degrees out there right now. Huh. Yeah, no, I was, uh, I actually took a nap <laughs> while, while we were out. Yeah. yeah. I have to work really late tonight because the uh, I have a big two hour interview thing, oral history interview thing going on from seven to nine, so. Yeah. Nothing's better than a 10 minute nap. Yeah, really. <laughs> I don't power usually. Nap. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> On right. the farm, we used to use those power naps as much as you could. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah, I'm not usually very good at them, but I apparently went out on this one. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. We used to get up at three and then. We get home about seven in the morning at six thirty, and then we go and take a quick power nap, and then go back right at it. All right, it looks like we've got folks back. Good afternoon. Senator's having a hard time getting in again. I just sent it. Oh, you did. Thank you. Okay. We'll take another okay. second. Okay. Representative Warren, which bill are we going to start with? Um, I don't see, um, we could start with either. We have both Senator Trey Stewart here and Representative Pluker here. Why don't we let uh, Representative, uh, I mean, Senator Stewart, where Representative Pluker is going to be with us all afternoon anyways. <laughs> Representative Pluker, are you amenable to that? I am. I, I got a couple people waiting to go, but I'm. But Representative Stewart probably does too. Thank you. So let's start with Senator Stewart's bill, which is LD 1699, an act to establish the Southern Aroostook County Emergency Medical Services Authority. Good afternoon, Senator Stewart. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, and my friends on the Criminal Justice Public Safety Committee. It's a beautiful cool. day up in the county. Hope you're having a good day as well. With that, I will begin my written testimony. Senator DeShembo, Representative Warren. Right, I, I, I sent you that to try and get around whatever's going wrong with your link. Um, Deb, you're not muted. Sorry. I'm trying That's okay. To <laughs> Happens to all of us. Okay, Senator, go ahead. Thank you. Wouldn't, wouldn't be a good Zoom hearing without at least one <laughs> accidental unmuting. 
Um, members of the Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety, I'm Senator Trey Stewart and have the honor of representing 51 communities in Aroostook and Penobscot counties. I'm pleased to be with you today to present LD 1699, an act to establish the Southern Aroostook County Emergency Medical Services Authority. Earlier this year, I was informed of a critical situation in Southern Aroostook County where the rural ambulance service is presently operated drastically increases its rates for the towns that it serves. This left these towns in an incredibly difficult situation, given that they are required to provide an ambulance service, but that the only present option is now unaffordable for the communities that it serves. Thankfully, a group of stakeholders from these 13 communities came together to brainstorm solutions to the problem. Representative Johansson and I attended a meeting with these interested parties where they asked us to put in legislation uh, that is like the policy of the 129th legislate that, that the 129th legislature approved in central Aroostook County for ambulance service. I was involved uh, in that bill, the previous one, uh, and had attended local meetings discussing the program uh, and, uh, and the progress that it has made and can attest that it has largely been a success. While the legislation and program consisted of three towns, this proposal would contain as many as 13. There are nine towns that have confirmed their desire to move forward with the program through a public meeting process at the local level. There are at least four towns which have not been able to conduct these meetings or take public positions on this proposal yet. Given the impending deadlines, as we work to close out the special session of the legislature, the revisor's office pushed us to move faster, which we did to the best of our ability. Quite literally, there were towns being added to, this, to the list the day that the bill was printed as information was coming in that quickly and we had to add towns to the list, to the list in the bill. Uh, ensuring that affordable ambulance service remains uh, available in rural communities is a critical endeavor that we should all be supportive of in the legislature, particularly when the laws require that we approve these efforts. It's critical that this legislation, that the legislature act this session rather than delaying as these towns cannot afford another year uh, to go a year without ambulance service contracts that don't cripple their local budgets. I believe that there's a representative from the communities that has been uh, that has been convening uh, on this issue and you, who you'll be able to hear from later today that can underscore the dire need for this resolution without delay. And I look forward to hearing their testimony soon. Finally, I would present to the committee two considerations for this bill. First, that an emergency preamble be added to the, le to the language to ensure that it goes into effect without delay. Second, that the committee consider other language rather than the explicit listing of each of these towns to determine whether less stringent, lang stringent language would be sufficient. To the latter point, should the other four towns vote in favor of joining this program when the legislature has adjourned in roughly a month, uh, is it possible that the language is uh, flexible enough to simply incorporate them without a statutory amendment? And we all know how arduous that process can be. Perhaps there is some expert who, can, uh, who is better first versed on the subject that will testify after me today. Uh, if it proves that this cannot be done, I would still encourage the, uh, the, the, the committee approve this bill for passage this session. And if the towns decide to participate in the interim, we can add them in an emergency bill in January when we return for the second session. I appreciate this committee's time and attention to this matter. I'm happy to answer any questions anyone has. Thank you, Senator Stewart. Questions for Senator Stewart? Senator, I just have a quick one. Can you give us just a quick reminder of, I remember we had this process at the very end of, yeah, could you give us just a quick reminder of what we did that was so helpful? <laughs> yeah, so um, essentially um, what we did was allow these uh, communities to form their own rural ambulance service that's specific to those communities. And so the language in the 129th was for three towns in central Aroostook, um, which um, required a statutory change. I'm, I'm not entirely sure what all the history is there and why that is the case, but um, there is a precedent set for, for operating um, this way. And essentially what we did with this bill was copy that language and transfer it over into, uh, into this bill structure. Um, I'll flag one point too, that um, the committee may want to make a determination on. If we do get up to um, 13 towns, which I think is probably as high as you could, 
conceivably go given just the geographic constraints in Southern Aroostook County. Um, if we did do that, the, the language currently reads that each town will have three board members, which worked fine for the, the previous bill because um, there, there, there were only three towns, so a total of nine members. If that's the case with this one, uh, conceivably, you know, you'd, you'd have up to 39 people serving on uh, one board, if I did the math right. And that may be a little bit too large. Um, as it reads right now, I believe there's 27 members on that same board. That might be a point that the committee wants to um, think about is perhaps you reduce it down to one or two members um, on representing each town on that board. Um, but again, that's sort of a determination that you guys will have to, you know, weigh going forward, but subtle differences there, but it's essentially the same proposal. Thank you. Thank you for the reminder. That was exactly what I needed. Um, Representative Luckner. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Stewart, for bringing this bill. Um, so I know a number of municipalities have been sort of giving up their uh their, their municipal EMS uh, outfits or operations in favor of, uh, you know, an outfit like Northeast Ambulance or something like that. Does this bill have anything in there about these, uh, this service being provided by the municipalities, by the county or by a, uh, a contractor, for instance? So I can sort of explain how um, the central rustic proposal has actually played out in practice in real time because to my knowledge that was the first one to be to be done in that way um and it's it's been uh, from my opinion pretty successful so uh there the, the the board will figure out what it is that they need to service their area and then craft a budget that then is distributed throughout uh the communities on that board um they will then, uh, depending on how it's broken down, typically it's done by um, population size. Um, and so that cost is then, you know, distributed throughout the members of the, the, the compact, basically. Um, the, the problem that they've really run into, uh, to be candid, is that it, the, the ambulance service is based out of Holton, which is the largest uh, municipal municipality in, in that neck of the woods um, went up significantly year to year. And to, I, I believe by like a factor of four. And so um, that, that made it pretty untenable for a lot of these other communities. Um, and it's my understanding that Holton doesn't actually need these other communities in there in order to continue to provide the service that they're providing to the people that live in Holton. But when you get out into you know, Oakfield and Smyrna and in Southwestern Arusa County, it gets more expensive and um, it, it's largely un untenable at that point. Um, and again, I, I'm hoping that the representative from the board will be here today to actually speak more about the details behind that. Um, the piece that's interesting, and, and I don't, and, and I, I legitimately don't know the answer to this question, but is there a way to make it so that rather than uh, having to change a statute every time that a town wants to get included in, in, in um, this proposed service, is there a way to incorporate language so that um, by a local determination of the board, for instance, or by a vote at the local level, plus a you know, favorable vote out of the board that another town will be added, because as you guys all know, <laughs> and gals, uh, it, it, it sometimes is challenging to get a bill through, right? Even if it makes a lot of sense. But the point is, if you've got to make put a bill in for every little thing that comes up, that, that might present some challenges going forward, particularly I'm thinking when we're not in session. Um, so something for, for folks to chew on on this committee. Um, and I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. I'm hoping that somebody behind me can speak more to that, and, and maybe has a has an idea or a thought in that regard. Um, hopefully, that answers your question. I, I covered a lot of ground there because there are a couple of points I wanted to clarify <laughs> too. Yeah. Thanks. I think I got the picture. Appreciate it. 
Representative Morales. Thanks, Madam Chair, and thank you, um, Senator Stewart. I mean, I think this makes a lot of sense, um, you know, financial sense to take advantage of economies of scale where this has really been tricky um, based on the distance. Um, and so I guess, and also your points about being prescriptive, that they make a lot of sense as well. You know, there should be a way uh, that we can figure this out so that communities can participate and join without having legislation. So just wondering too, like, and you've had the experience in the central part of Arusta County with this kind of model. Why is it that it needs a statutory, and I'm not against it, I'm just wondering, like, why do we need a statutory framework for this? And wh what is that, how does that benefit this particular quasi, because I imagine it would then become a quasi governmental entity. Um, and so if you can answer that for me, that would be great. Sure. Um, so it, it's a little bit of a gray area and I'm hoping that somebody behind me can explain a little bit on the history of that. Cause that goes back, you know, a number of years to, to why it, I think they started that in 2019, maybe in 2019 was when uh, the first one was put in place. And, and I recall we kicked around a diff bunch of different options at that point. And this was the one that we, we came up with. Um, as you folks know, it's required that there be a ambulance service provided in every community in Maine, right? What that service looks like is um, sort of up to the determination of the local folks. Um, this is just proved to be the better option in some instances, not in every community, right? It probably doesn't make sense to do something like this in Prescott. We've got, as you mentioned, an economy of scale here. Same idea in Holton. Um, but outside of Presque Isle, it was a problem, right? And so that was where the central heuristic uh, regional sort of collaborative effort came from. And, and candidly, I think those sort of efforts are going to be how rural parts of the state really survive, um, particularly as, you know, population declines. Um, so, uh, you know, any time that we can get folks working together on, on some of these ideas, I think is a good thing. And, and hopefully it'll translate to into more collaboration going forward more, you know, cost sharing and finding creative ways to continue to offer a quality service to the residents that live there without, you know, um, busting budgets at the local level. Okay, great. Thanks. Any other questions for Senator Stewart? Seeing none. Thank you, Senator. I'll now call for any co-sponsors or legislators here to testify, please raise your hand. Seeing none, I'll now call for those here to testify in support of LD 1699. If you're here to testify in support, please raise your hand. I'm bringing uh, William Dobbins over. Thank you, Deb. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Representative Warren, are you able to hear me? I am, and we can see your forehead. There you go. <laughs> That's <laughs> the best part of me. <laughs> you were showing us your best side. Welcome. Yes. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody on the committee. Uh, first off, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Senator Stewart for uh, speaking so uh, honestly about the situation that is facing 13 towns in the Southern Rustic area. As indicated, my name is William Dobbins. I'm a member of the committee that was put together of the 13 different uh, community members uh, that we have. The 13 communities that we're talking about is Amity, Cary, Hodgton, Linnaeus, New Limerick, Ludlow, Hamden, Dyerbrook, Merrill, Smyrna, Oakfield. So you can see they're a very small community there Roughly add them all up, there's about 7,000 in population there. <clears throat> the uh, Ambulance Committee has worked very hard. We met once a week, usually on a Monday, and looked out uh, different options that we could face this trying situation um, that has faced us, these small communities. As you know, the economics in small community is very tight. We have to watch it very carefully. When we have an ambulance bill that was uh, sent 
sent to us within 30 days of payment of 300, uh, 300% increase, it was uh, daunting, uh, one would say, to take a look at that. As we went through the process the last few months, we discovered that we were able to put together a very good set of bylaws, which happens to be patterned after the one in uh, Marcel, Blaine, and uh, Bridgewater uh, that uh, Senator Stewart has uh, talked about previously. We also have put together a budget. Um, at that time, we went to the towns individually. Uh, as you know, uh, the time and with everything uh, not as usually you, uh, done as quickly as we've done in the past because of the pandemic and other social dynamics we have to be watching out for. What we've got, what we found out that majority of the selectmen that we've talked to are all agreeable to this. We have set up towns meetings uh, for the towns have already voted for it. The four towns are um, New Limerick, I believe. Uh, there is four towns anyway. Uh, Hodgton, Ludlow, uh, Linnaeus, and Amity all have agreed through public vote on that point. So we're moving as fast as we can at this week, at this uh, time. This week, there's six other meetings uh, that are uh, scheduled with the townspeople uh, with the recommendation coming from their selectmen from each town that we support this effort. <clears throat> I do like to talk about one thing that uh, Senator Stewart indicated is if we could be a little more flexible on the name of the towns within the bill, in the bill would be very helpful. Uh, because as you know, uh, some of the smaller towns, it's very difficult to get a town meeting uh, in this short time as we're looking toward the end of June coming along. Um, we, in these committee meetings, we had, direct, we had directions help from other ambulance directors that came in and spoke to us to show us the pitfalls and things they had to be aware of. And we worked through those, those problems. And I gotta commend the other members of uh, my committee that, um, and also Jim Griffin, who is the town manager of Hodgton. We have spent numerous hours on this situation. Um, and we think it's very feasible that we can put this problem, this uh, situation uh, to the communities and have a very uh, compatible and outstanding service of ambulance to our residents in these 13 towns. Um, that's in a snapshot. I would entertain any questions that any member would have at this time. Thank you, Mr. Dobbins. Any questions from the committee? Um, just a piece of information for our analyst. Um, Jane, you probably heard this as well, but to just make note of uh, for the committee when we're working this bill, how, if possible, we might allow for the addition of towns that haven't had a chance to have um, their meetings yet and, and how we do that statutorily. Um, I just wanted to add that to the list. Um, so no questions for Mr. Dobbins. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Dobbins, for being here. Anyone else here to testify? in support of this bill? Seeing none, anyone here to testify in opposition to this bill, LD 1699? Seeing none, anyone here to testify neither for nor against LD 1699? Great. Bringing Thanks. Sam Hurley over. Great, thank you, Deb. Good afternoon, Director Hurley. Thank you for being with us. Good afternoon. I feel like I'm playing Red Rover, Red Rover. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> no, happy EMS week, everyone. Um, this week is National EMS Week. Um, so I appreciate all of the incredible work that EMS professionals throughout the state, including in this area, do on a daily basis. So happy EMS week. Um, I also can answer some of the questions that were posed um, by Senator um, Stewart, and I will reserve that for the end of my testimony, if that's okay with everyone. Perfect. Uh, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and honorable members of the Joint Committee 
uh, in criminal justice and public safety. My name is Sam Hurley, and I'm the director of Maine Emergency Medical Services, or Maine EMS, within the Department of Te Public Safety. I am testifying on behalf of Maine Department of Public Safety and Maine EMS, neither for nor against LD 1699. We are supportive of establishing a governing authority comprised of elective officials as it empowers the local community to hold their representatives accountable. This multi-jurisdictional authority should be use a team approach to provide emergency medical services, reflect viewpoints of all participating towns, and ensure that every resident of these towns has adequate representation through their elected official. Local governance of EMS will help target the specific needs of the local system. That said, Maine EMS does have concerns about the carrying capacity of the community to support and maintain a standalone EMS service within their area. Data and information were shared with Representative Quint, a co-sponsor of this bill, regarding this potential project that showed that there is currently insufficient call volume to support a single ambulance based on national funding models. These models suggest that every ambulance would need to run approximately 1,500 to 1,800 calls annually to support full-time staffing. In this area, there were only 200 to 220 calls annually for the past five years. That said, Maine EMS recommends that this legislation include a provision that requires the established authority to perform a needs assessment of their community to better understand their system's needs and goals while also understanding the capacity to support it. This assessment should be done, used to define the comprehensive EMS system plan for that geographical area that they intend on serving for its ongoing sustainability. This plan should specify how the local system will collect and submit data to hold the credential agency that is created accountable for its performance. It should be important to note that the governing authority should create a plan with input from the EMS agency administrator, regional EMS partners, and main EMS. These parties will offer the governing authority a wealth of organizational, on the ground, industrial uh, industry knowledge that will enable the creation of a more robust plan. Developing a plan for the region defined by this legislation will create accountability and help define a level and quality of services that is expected for these communities. As the ultimate authority for the provision of emergency medical services within the state of Maine, Maine EMS believes that a comprehensive plan should be submitted to the Board of EMS for approval in this jurisdiction. I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you may have at this time. Please feel free to reach out to me anytime if there's any additional information I can offer you and or the committee. And before I turn to questions, I do want to clarify something that Senator Stewart said. He said that um, towns are required to provide ambulance service, and that is not the case. Uh, we join a cadre of 38 other states in the United States that have not mandated that ambulance services are essential services. Um, so you're, provide, you're required to pilot law, law enforcement and you're required to provide a firefighter, but not an EMS clinician. And that is something that we hope the legislature will help us address uh, going forward into the future. However, you know, that's a unfunded mandate business uh, that gets a little hairy. So uh, that is something that we, we hope to work towards addressing. The first time, so some history behind this, uh, the first um, the first organized quasi-governmental entity that was formed was done in 2001 with Washington County EMS, uh, also now known as Down East EMS. That's where this came from. I will tell you, in my personal experience, I'm not sure why they need this legislation. Um, I believe they should be able to establish this, but as a, as a 501c3, um, and have it partly owned by the local government. However, I'm not an attorney, nor am I a, a business analyst either. So there may be additional things that I'm not aware of. However, I have had conversations with others where we're not sure that this is entirely necessary anymore. Um, and while there's an established precedent, I don't want it to preclude people from doing what's right for their community either. Thank you, Thank you, Director Hurley, for that. Um, I'm going to start with questions from Representative Morales and then Representative Luckner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Director Hurley. Thank you for giving us that um, 
that history too. So is that, so when you're talking about the Washington County EMS, that's the only entity that was formed by statute like this, like this proposal is, is proposing to do? That was the first one. So there've been two others. There's the Down East EMS that was in Washington County. And then there's a central aroostic that Senator Stewart spoke about, but the, the other one was just 2001. So it was pre several, you know, 20 years ago. Okay. Um, so there's two operating in the system now. Okay. Um, do, do you, as, as does MEMA, the statewide MEMA, um, do, do, do we, do you devote, div, uh, devote resources to those entities? So we are in, we are housed within the Department of Public Safety, not within the main emergency management agency. Um, but the Department of Public Safety does provide technical assistance uh, to the best of our abilities to any agency, including those two agencies um, as needed. And any agency is able to request data from us um, as needed as well. So if they have data requests or data needs uh, to be able to assess their performance, we also offer quality assurance guidance and quality assurance training um, in support of them as well. May I follow up, Madam Chair? Yes, please. So, so just to kind of understand that, um, there's no line item budget in your budget to support, for example, the Washington County EMS or the Central Aroostook, but just like you would provide for any EMS, the technical um, assistance and things of that nature, that's what you're saying? Yes, ma'am. So uh, it's the same benefits that we offer any agency, whether it be MedQ in Portland or Scarborough Fire Department or Northeast Mobile Health Services. Um, they receive, all receive the same benefits and support from us, um, but there's no specific line item from us that we have to, um, there's no fiduciary items that we have to account for for these specific agencies. Okay, so then if I'm to understand sort of your, your, um, your comments, remarks about this proposal um, are really about, you want them to do some planning to see if it's needed. Um, in a certain way, rather yeah. than the way they've already done it, or whatever they've already done, you think they need to do something different. So my concern is the long-term sustainability of this. So I think that there's a, I, I certainly agree that there is service, there are services that are needed. No one's disputing that. And I certainly do uh, support the idea of empowering local officials to be held responsible and accountable for those services. What I worry about is we create this service with a 300 member board, pardon me for the exaggeration, a 37 member board. And then in four years, they find out that it's not fiscally sustainable. And then we have, you know, six or seven towns now that are trying to figure out how to raise taxes to pay for it. Um, and because I, the, the concern was that Holton raised their fees um, for their per capita rate for ambulance services. And the reality is, is I don't believe, and granted this is an assumption, so couch it in that, I don't believe Holton raised their prices so that they could make a profit off of another town. They raised their prices because it's expensive to provide EMS services. And when you're thinking full-time staffing and a monitor that alone costs $30,000 and a $250,000 ambulance, you know, and equipment that costs $50,000 to outfit your, your vehicle, it costs a lot of money to run an EMS service. And I just wanna make sure that the, these communities they know exactly what they're buying into and they know exactly what they're taking on because I would really hate for us to build all this infrastructure and have a great system for it to fail in four years because it's not phys fiscally solvent. That's what I worry about. Thank you so much. Representative Luckner. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Director Hurley. Um, so a... <sighs> A county, are, are there any counties that have these services? Uh, could this be like, could I, it seems like this should be a county thing. Um, so do we have any counties that provide this service? And I also want to know what happens in an unincorporated township or just a, a really small municipality since we do not have 
a, a mandate that we have uh, coverage. So what happens if there is an EMS call to one of these towns? Uh, so I guess that's a two-part question. Absolutely. And phenomenal questions, Senator Lickner. Phenomenal questions. So for the first question, there, me. I'm, a, I'm a representative. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, so for the first question, there are no county based EMS services in the state of Maine. Most of the EMS services are based out of local municipal governments or collectives of mo local municipal governments like Down East or Central Aroostook. That is contrary to what it goes on in many other states where they have county based systems. I came from North Carolina where there are almost exclusively only county based systems, uh, which provides for a greater band of sustainability because you have the county seats or the larger towns that are able to help support fiscally the sustainability to support those rural areas that may not have the population density that would be able to support one. Those currently do not exist in Maine. However, there is there are ongoing conversations about what greater regionalization looks like and what that model would look like going forward. And Maine EMS as a board is undergoing strategic planning where I have a feeling that there will be legislative action that likely will be presented to you that speaks to some of those topics. Because when we talk about the long-term sustainability of EMS it going into the future, there will need to be some way that we can provide services to everyone um, and that we can support them using the infrastructure that we have. And then the second question, if someone calls a 911 in an unincorporated town or in a town that does not provide EMS services, that call goes to the closest PSAP or answering service, the 911 answering service, and then they will dispatch, they will call the next closest town, and if they're unable to take the call, they'll call the next town. If they're unable to take the call, they'll call the next town and continue down the, down the line. And so those towns are not obligated to take those calls. For instance, say you this would completely not happen because it's Portland and the Portland area, but say you have Portland um, has only one ambulance available right now and South Portland needs, uh, needs assistance. Portland may not send that one ambulance to South Portland for assistance because then they would not have any ambulances in the city of Portland. So they may say you need to call Scarborough to send an ambulance to South Portland so that way you don't pull out all of the resources in those towns. And so that's the problem with having all of these smaller agencies around the state is that it really hinders some interoperability concerns that you may have. So that's how that would work. Um, I will tell you that there are some instances in really rural isolated towns where it may be 20, 30 minutes before you get an ambulance because they have to call around to find one that can come. Thank you. Other questions for Director Hurley? Yes, Representative Newman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Hurley, uh, do you know, I, I, I know Windsor used to have an ambulance. They discontinued it and started having Delta respond. Uh, what was their reasoning behind that? Was that cost on that? So I can't speak to that particular incident uh, or that particular case as to why they elected to discontinue their service. Um, however, there has been, uh, there's always an ebb and flow throughout our system of people coming in and out of service or providing more or less services throughout the state. And there, there is a precedent nationally of um, relationships with for-profit or not-for-profit uh, private ambulance services to help offset uh, the cost locally. So I can't speak to that particular in that particular case, but um, there is a precedent to have those public-private relationships to help deliver the services as needed for the community. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hurley. Uh, I know out in Belgrade, where I'm from right now, we just have Delta respond. So, I mean, we, the town itself, we don't pay anything for ambulances. Uh, we do have the rescue and our fire department, but uh, we don't do any transport. So um, that seems like the most effective and efficient way of doing it. 
Thank you. Any other questions for Director Hurley? Seeing none, Director Hurley, thank you very much for being here. My pleasure. And if there's any questions, please don't hesitate to um, shoot them over to me and we'll do our best to answer them as quickly as possible. Thank you very much. Will you be able to be at the work session, which is, I believe, on Monday? Jane, did we schedule that for Monday? Do you remember? Uh, Tuesday, the 25th at one o'clock. Great. I have a doctor's appointment at 1 p.m. If, if it's not the first bill being heard, I will be on there after that. Um, should be 1.30. <laughs> okay, we'll make a note to run that a little later. We have a bunch of other ones that afternoon. So thank you very much, Director. Absolutely, thank you for your patience. Sure, anyone else here to testify neither for nor against? LD 1699. Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing on LD 1699 and open the public hearing on LD 1683 with our very own Representative Pluker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to the whole committee for giving me a chance to present LD 1683. A resolve to compensate Department of Corrections employees for hazardous work. And I just want to kind of kick things off by saying that the bill as written was just focused on Department of Corrections employees, but uh, it's come to my attention that there are some employees with at uh, Riverview and Dorothea Dix doing very similar work or in a similar situation that we might want to work to include in uh, as we go into the work session. One of the first things that the governor ordered as the pandemic began last year was that those with direct resident contact in our prisons and, and also in the Dorothea Dixon and review receive an additional $5 an hour stipend. Now I have $5 an hour stipend in, the, in my written testimony here, but there's some folks who have, got, who have a $3 an hour stipend while on the job. The reason that such quick action was taken was the realization that if we started having COVID outbreaks in the prisons with the current law, low staffing, levels due to poor pay, our correctional officers might have stopped showing up to work and we have had a crisis inside. As the, this committee is quite aware, our correctional officers are regularly mandated after their 12 hour shift to continue working because there are not sufficient staff in the facility to maintain safety and security. Many of us are also aware that the staff could make more money working on in a security capacity and other such much less demanding arenas such as banks or BIW. Our staff work under extremely difficult circumstances and are not paid enough. The $5 or $3 an hour stipend continued until the end of the year when the first wave of federal dollars were spent, all gone. The danger did not stop. In fact, MSP did not have a COVID outbreak at the prison until 2021, this past spring. MCC has had various outbreaks throughout the spring. The danger of getting COVID inside continues, but the hazard pay has not. The correctional officers continue to show up to work, potentially bringing the sickness back to their families and loved ones. They continue to show up because walking away from their responsibility is not an option, certainly not because they are paid adequately for the work they do. At the time that I submitted this bill, we did not know that ARP money or the rest of the money coming from the federal or about the rest of the money coming from the federal government. But I figured that we were likely to see something coming. This bill is simple in its action. If money comes from the federal government that is permitted by the federal rules to be used to pay correctional officers hazard pay, then we must make our correctional officers whole. We must pay them the stipend for the hours that they have been putting in since the start of the year when they were coming to work and risking their health for the functioning of our prisons. And they must be paid hazard pay until the emergency is, is declared over by the governor. The officers have been crucial to the functioning of the prisons and the Department of Corrections nation leading control of COVID inside the prisons. This would not have been possible if our correction officers had not accepted the risk and gone to work despite the conditions. Properly compensating them for the work they have done and the service they have provided the state must be our highest priority as a legislature and as a government. Please join me in showing our support of our officers and support the passage of this resolve. Thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Representative Pluker. Any questions for Representative Pluker? Seeing none. I'm now going to call for um, Senator DeChambeau. You're on mute. Thank you. 
Representative Booker, I, I read this and the second thing I, I took note of is you want it retroactive to when they stopped in December? Yes, it was the last, I believe it was December 31st was the last day they were being paid their hazard pay. Do you know the total number of officers and non-custodial staff? I do not know the numbers. Okay. Um, I will be followed by members of the bargaining unit and they might be able to give you a better sense of what the staffing numbers are. Is it bargaining units with an S? Yes, there are, because we have both SEIU as well as AFSCME involved. Good. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Searway. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Representative Pluka, do you have any information of, um, I, I think the staff members were able to be vaccinated first. So how's that work when it comes to paying them for hazard pay if they've already been vaccinated? Uh, there, they have a series of agreements that they've written with the, the governor or with the executive branch and vaccinations was not taken into account in any of that situation. Um, so that they never said that once people get vaccinated that they no longer deserve hazard pay. Um, my argument would be that it's still a dangerous situation to go home because you could be uh, taking home uh, COVID to your family potentially. Thank Any you. other questions for Representative Pluker? Seeing none. Any legislators or co-sponsors here to testify on LD 1683? Seeing none, we'll now take testimony in support of LD 1683. And if you're here, if you'd please raise your hand, we'll move you in. I'm bringing in three people. Thank you, Deb. It looks like we have somebody on the phone as well, and I don't know how to tell if they want to raise their hand or not, so I'll leave you to that. I'll allow them to talk and we can ask. Okay, perfect. For the person on the phone ending in the number 6012, are you here to testify in support of the bill? Well, let's move on and we'll try to ascertain what's going on um, there. Okay, so first I see that we have Mr. Durkin, Jim Durkin, welcome. Mr. Durkin, if you're talking, you might be muted because we can't hear you. Let's go to uh, Mr. Jeff McCabe. You folks Good hear afternoon. me right? Excellent. Yes, thank you. Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and members of the Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety. My name is Jeff McCabe. I serve as the Director of Legislation and Politics for Maine Service Employees Association. I'm here in support of LD 1683. Uh, which would require Department of Corrections to use federal funding to pay eligible employees hazard pay uh, stipend related to COVID-19. Um, as you've heard from the bill sponsor, who we would like to thank for bringing this issue um, for this hearing today, and also to the bill sponsor for being quite an advocate for all folks working in corrections um, in really responding to our members and other members of other bargaining units at any time that they call and reach out about issues in the facility. Just wanted to say we truly appreciate that. Uh, when this pandemic began in March 2020, many state employees were not able to work remotely and were granted hazard pay, including the workers of uh, the correctional facilities. On December 23rd, 2020, MSCA received word that various hazard pay agreements for members and state government would be terminated, including the agreements for folks in DOC. These agreements were ter terminated despite our state being in the depths of one of the largest pandemic surges that we had seen thus far. 
These employees deserve to be compensated for their additional risks they face while doing the job and the risks they did that did not end on January 1st, 2021, when the federal funding ran out. This legislation would simply ensure that the Department of Correction employees who face significant risk of contracting COVID-19 would receive hazard pay. There is no doubt that Department of Corrections employees have been at the increased risk of COVID-19 throughout this pandemic. These workers have interacted with coworkers and incarcerated persons daily, often in spaces where social distancing was difficult and even more, I would say, impossible. These jobs could not be done remotely. Every day they've faced added stress of getting sick, getting their loved ones sick, uh, making their family members sick. And in some cases, workers have gotten sick and have been forced to quarantine themselves and their families, in some cases, multiple times. There have been numerous outbreaks of COVID-19 in DOC facilities, and we've included some links at the bottom of our testimony so that you can see firsthand news reports. Um, it's important to point out that the pandemic has only exacerbated longstanding issues within Department of Corrections around recruitment and retention of workers. The state recently released the market study report and they found workers on average uh, within state government earn 15% less than their public sector counterparts. But if you dive into that report a little bit more, you'll see positions like maintenance mechanics make 31% less, uh, administrative workers often 20 to 35% less, rehabilitation counselors 25% less, corrections officers 16% less, corrections captains 20% uh, 26% less than their counterparts. And you've also heard us talk about the issues uh, associated with certain stipends being applied to certain folks within the correctional facilities, but not yet others. Recently, we have learned that the Department of Corrections is actually hiring in corrections officers, uh, not at step one, which is uh, kind of the bottom of the pay scale when folks walk through the door, but actually recruiting folks at step three. So all of these things, um, as well as a pandemic, continue to create this perfect storm, which is only making it more difficult to recruit and retain officers. So with that, we are urging uh, the committee to pass LD 1683. Uh, and really, you know, what we hope is, is another attempt to hopefully uh, stop the hemorrhaging of folks uh, within corrections. And with that, I'm happy to answer questions, happy to be part of the work session, and also happy to provide uh, background information to the analysts if helpful. Thank you, Mr. McCabe. Questions for Jeff McCabe? Seeing none, thank you. And thank you for your offer to be at the work session. That'll be really helpful. Oh, we do have a question. Senator Searway. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, the Honorable McCabe. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Senator. It's good to see you. I, I wish we were in the cafeteria catching up. <laughs> right. Um, just a question on um, cost for this. Uh, how would we uh, pay it? And also, um, when would it end? Does it end when the mask mandate ends or because we get that coming up uh how's how does that work those two questions the cost and the mask mandate yeah thank you senator sirway um i, I think that uh, it had been msca's sort of view uh, when those agreements were signed for hazard pay that they would last uh while the state of emergency was in place uh, that continues to be in place. So we would argue that the, um, you know, the agreements that we have are, are sort of in place until the uh, state of emergency is over. As it relates to the mask mandate, I would actually imagine that for folks working in corrections as well as in other locations in state government, uh, just because the mask mandate, uh, you know, for those of us who might be vaccined, you know, running into the store for, for five to 10 minutes, uh, may be lifted or some of the mask mandates that uh, are associated with, um, you know, being outdoors being lifted. I imagine that those will continue to stay in place. I know this morning I woke up to a text from the school district saying that the mask mandates would stay in place for my children while in school. So, you know, I don't, I don't think necessarily, um, you know, we're going to see an end to that. And I, I did uh, hear your question before in regards to the vaccine 
And uh, there is some statistical data and some tracking the state has done. So they would have the percentages of who is vaccinated, um, I believe for, for the residents of the facilities, but also for uh, the staff, I believe they are tracking that. But I also uh, just wanna say that just because uh, someone's vaccinated doesn't necessarily mean they will not um, contract COVID. Uh, I, I think that uh, you know, in some cases it, it reduces the risk, um, it might uh, reduce the intensity of, of the, the illness, but we are seeing that people still are getting sick. And then I think long-term it's the, it's the discussion around the effectiveness of the vaccine. So all of those things to be considered. I think from, from our perspective, we would uh, probably look to the state to cost this out. There are two uh, scales right now as far as the, uh, the amount per hour of hazard pay that was in place. And there was uh, $3 for some of the folks uh, and then the folks uh, $5 for others. So I, I think that uh, we have a list within our agreement as far as who was receiving the $3 an hour um, hazard pay and then who was receiving the $5 an hour hazard pay. And I believe that would probably be similar for ASME. And I imagine most of the ASME folks were probably at the $5 um, mark, but I, I, I might be uh, wrong there. And then the other piece too is, is um, in regards to uh, bargaining units, there might be some folks uh, in MSLEA that may have also uh, be covered by this agreement because there are some folks that uh, are with MSLEA that are associated with the correctional facilities as well. So uh, probably the bulk of the folks are asked me in MSCA, but there might be a couple positions within MSLEA that are assigned to uh, the facilities as well. So. Next up, I have Senator DeChambeau. Thanks. Um, welcome, Mr. McCabe, the Honorable also. Um, MSLEA, before I start, I never heard of that. Is that law enforcement? That's correct, Senator. And uh, you know, my thoughts there are the folks that are uh, probation officers, as well as oh. there, um, there might be some investigators within corrections that may have received the hazard pay. Uh, and then there might also be uh, possibly, I don't know if the firearms instructor, instructors who are associated with Department of Corrections fall under MSLEA, so. Well, that brings me to my question. Um, and that's a big part that's missing in the introduction of the bill is um, I presume MSCA represents like administrative um, workers and pro professional technical and only the captains, right? Uh, for the most part. And then there's uh, a couple other positions, uh, Senator DeChambeau, like uh, director of security and some other pieces. But for the most part, it's, it's those support services and the supervisory folks. Yeah. So that that's what I would like to see is I didn't have input when the governor did authorize the hazard pay and this is to continue. So I did not take an interest or find out what that covered and who it covered and what positions. And now we're told it might extend to Dorothea Dix or any others. So um, I don't know, I should have asked Representative Pluker. The bill only talks about corrections. So I don't know if this is gonna expand to um, other institutional workers. So that, that's my only concern. What's the number we're looking at? Thank you. Thank you, Senator. And, and I will say that, um, you know, looking at our hazard pay agreements, I will provide our hazard pay agreements for the folks that are working in the state hospitals as well. I believe you'll see in my testimony, the, the agreement that we had with the state in regards to the folks that were associated with corrections. And I imagine, um, you know, ASME has a sim similar documentation that lists out the folks that received that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. McCabe? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. McCabe. Thank you. Next, I'm going to go to Mr. Durkin. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, sorry for the technical difficulties. No uh, worries. 
Appreciate it. Uh, for, for the record, I, I'm Jim Durkin. I'm here on behalf of Ask Me Council 93 in support of this legislation. Uh, it is very important to us that this bill also, in addition to our corrections offices, that it also apply to our mental health workers. And I'll, I'll get to that uh, why in a minute. Uh, it would benefit approximately 800 of our members working in state corrections and mental health. And, you know, a little over 14 months ago, I was standing in the state house in Augusta with some of these members for a lobby day when I learned we would be closing our offices in our four state region in response to the pandemic. And as I was making the drive home, my mind was weighing heavy with concern for these workers, knowing they wouldn't have the luxury of working from home that I'd have over the next several months. Uh, despite how quickly and how easily the virus was spreading, despite a worldwide shortage of PPE, and despite the urging of virtually all us experts that we should avoid leaving our homes and avoid all contact with those who weren't part of our immediate households, these workers had to leave their homes every single day and work in crowded environments with substandard protection in some of the most dangerous jobs in the public sector. Now, their jobs have always been dangerous, even under normal times. They work in high-stress environments, and they particularly deal with things like violent physical assaults from the individuals in their care and custody. So when you throw in a deadly virus spreading like a wildfire and claiming lives in one of the most horrible manners we can imagine, you have a work situation that none of us would ever want to experience, and I dare say many of us would have walked away from. But these men and women didn't do that. They continued to report to work faithfully. And at the end of every shift, they went home wondering if they had contracted a virus that would kill them in the next few weeks. And even worse, wondering if they brought home a virus, that virus to the people they love. So fortunately, back in early of April 2020, Governor Mills recognized the bravery and dedication of these workers in the form of signed agreements providing additional hazard pay. They were from 3 to $5 per hour, again, for roughly the 800 ASME members bravely staffing these mental health and correctional facilities. And under these signed agreements, the additional pay would be provided until the governor declared an end to the COVID-19 civil emergency. But unfortunately, despite the clear language in these agreements, we received a letter on December 23rd from DAF's Commissioner Karen Figueroa stating that the state would cease providing the hazard pay at the end of the month. Now, it's important to note that we continue to communicate with the Mills administration in an effort to see our signed agreements uh, honored and for the past several months, our efforts have involved ongoing dialogue. And at the same time, since the commissioner's letter terminating the, the pay, blame the expiration on funding included in the Federal CARES Act, we've also been simultaneously doing our part in conjunction with our national union to successfully secure the additional direct aid to states and municipalities that we found in the American Rescue Plan. Uh, we still hold out hope that this ongoing dialogue with the Mills administration will yield the results we're looking for. However, we welcome this legislation as another avenue towards providing our members with the additional pay that they deserve, that they've earned, and they are entitled to under the signed agreements. I thank you for your consideration. I'll do my best to answer any questions you or the community may have. Thank you, Mr. Durkin. Any questions? Senator Searway, I think that's an old hand up. Um, seeing no questions, Mr. Durkin, you heard when the um, work session will be next Tuesday afternoon? Yes. Okay. Will you be able to also be here? Absolutely. Wonderful. And, and we'll Thank also get to, as, as uh, Mr. Excuse me, the Honorable uh, Mr. McCabe, uh, <laughs> uh, we'll provide those, those signed agreements for you as well. Thank you. That's terrific. Thank um, you. Representative Pickett. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Durkin, for being here. I understand the need for the uh, for the pay, the stipend, but why the retroactive? Well, uh, it, it, as I said, sir, the agreements that were signed we, clearly stated that this pay would be provided through the end of the of the uh, declaration of the emergency. Which so it's based. It's based on the declaration of the emergency rather than the actual, the actual hazard of the pandemic. Well, I I, I think the hazard went on well beyond. I should say we believe the hazard went on well beyond 
uh, December 23rd, uh, without a doubt. And they, they, there still is uh, risks imposed. And, and, and I would agree with you, there are risks, sir. And uh, I, I, I hear what you're saying and I, and I understand it, but I just, I have a hard time uh, telling people that are paying, this is tax dollars, whether it's federal money or not, it's still tax dollars. Somebody has to pay for this money. And we're going to all pay it through federal tax because it just doesn't come on trees. We know that. So I have a hard time telling taxpayers that you're going to, that are out working and have been working through this pandemic in jobs that have put them at risk many, many times. So, you know, I, I, that's what I'm trying to kind of weigh through is to see. I understand the beginning of it and I understand being in the prisons and understand that. But there's just some things there that just I'm going to I'm going to have a hard time trying to put those things together. Thank you. Thank you. Let's save our debating for the work session because I'm sure we'll certainly have an opportunity then to debate this bill. Do I have any questions for Representative Durkin? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Durkin, for uh, being here. Mr. MacGyver, MacGyver, welcome. Yes, hi. It's Mick Iver, so like two words. Okay, excuse me. Welcome. Okay. Thank you. No for problem. Being. You may go ahead. All right. Uh, I'm here to testify in support of the bill. Uh, I work with the DS crisis team. Um, that's the developmental services. It deals with people with brain injury, autism, um, Asperger's, um, fetal alcohol, that kind of thing. Um, I do direct care in a home where I'm working 12 or 16 hour shifts in close contact, providing medications, food, um, support. The person I currently work with has seizures, so I'm within arm's length to keep them uh, safe. Um, I can see the spittle and stuff coming out of their mouth, so I am in the line of fire um, when it comes to uh, an airborne disease. Um, we do transports that are over an hour in a van where we're breathing the same air for extended periods of time. And all I have is this, um, that's any kind of protection. Um, I've been doing this uh, since the very beginning of the pandemic and it hits home for me because the 20th, I was told I was going to be working with a client, uh, 20th of December, I was told I was going to be working with a client with um, uh, COVID. Um, I worked my shift the 21st after raising concerns. They didn't have a good plan. They didn't have any support and I contracted COVID. So this isn't hypothetical. This has affected me. Um, I ended up missing my daughter's first Christmas, quarantining away from her. And um, luckily I was able to keep my wife and my daughter safe from COVID um, because I have a big enough house where I was able to stay downstairs for two weeks. Um, during that time, I got no support from the state. No one called to check on me. No one told me what I needed to do to come back to work. They said, as soon as you don't have a fever, come back. Um, I really have, I don't even know. <laughs> so um, I, I just felt like I was left out, hung out to dry. And um, same thing with the, the vaccine where I got no support about getting it early, even though I worked direct care with somebody. Um, when it became available to my age bracket, the state didn't help me get it. I was on my own, they said, to get the vaccine, and they don't even require us to get the vaccine. So um, that's not a, a shield. Um, I do enter people's houses uh, as part of my job. There's no guarantee that I'm entering into a place that they've all been vaccinated, um, whether it's the, the staff or the people. So um, it, it definitely weighs on me, though, that I have a one-year-old and uh, a diabetic wife that um, I could bring it home to. So. Thank you, Mr. McIver. Whoops, I hear an echo sharing your testimony. Um, any questions for Mr. McIver? Seeing none, thank you very much for um, sharing your story with us today. Thank you. Anyone else here to testify in support of LD 1683? 
Seeing none, anyone here to testify in opposition to LD 1683? I'm bringing over Anya Trundy. Thank you, Deb. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and honorable members of the Joint Standing Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety. My name is Anya Trundy. I am the Director of Legislative Affairs for the Department of Administrative and Financial Services, and I come before you today to provide testimony in opposition to LD 1683. When the pandemic first impacted Maine with so many unknowns, certain job functions were offered an augmented hourly rate known as hazard pay. The states moved swiftly to execute MOUs with the collective bargaining units of these job functions. At the time, we could not yet fathom the state of emergency lasting as long as it has. As such, expiration of the initial hazard pay agreements was tied to the end of the state of emergency, whereas subsequent MOUs include language allowing for termination within seven days notice. Hazard pay was funded with federal coronavirus relief funds which as of mid-December 2020, Congress still hadn't taken any action to extend and were set to expire on December 30th of 2020. Absent CRF, the state has insufficient, had insufficient resources to continue hazard pay into the next calendar year and notified impacted employees that hazard pay would not continue as part of our response to COVID-19 as we moved into 2021. It is important to recognize that in the many months between first executing the hazard pay agreements and terminating them, we have learned a great deal about COVID-19 and how to keep employees safe. We have instituted robust work rules and incorporated CDC sanctioned co-worker contact tracing for any employee impacted by COVID-19. Governor Mills has provided generous paid leave options for 2021 to ensure employees can keep themselves and their families safe. Additionally, we have instituted environment specific safety protocols and have procured significantly significant specialty PPE. At this point in time, we can also report the DOC has been has offered employees multiple opportunities to obtain their vaccine on site and provided vaccinations to residents with a very high uptake rate. We take the safety and well being of all of our employees seriously and are proud of the time, energy and significant funding invested in this effort. AFSCME has grieved the December termination of the hazard pay agreement pertaining to corrections employees. MSCA has done similarly on behalf of certain DAFs and DHHS employees in addition to the DOC employees they represent. DAFs respectfully request that the grievances filed be resolved through the, inten the intended process rather than this resolves superseding that process. Through the grievance process, settlement can be reached at any time, potentially adverting the need for arbitration. Thank you for allowing me to testify before you today. I am happy to respond to any questions that you might have. If I don't have the answers, I am happy to bring them back to the work session. Thank you very much for your testimony. We're going to start with a question from Representative Costain, and then we'll go to Senator DeChambeau. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for being here this afternoon. So, in fact, did we sign an agreement with the union saying that we were going to give them hazard pay until the pandemic was over? So there are two there are two groups of, of agreements. The first group of executed agreements, which were the very first ones that were executed, they do have language in them that states uh, that ties the, the termination of them to the end of the state of emergency. Um, the later executed agreements, um, kind of the second and third waves, those include language that allowed us to terminate them within seven days, with seven days notice. And that, so that is why we, we gave notice on December 23rd, given the expiration of the, the CRF funds on the 30th of December. A follow up, ma'am. Yes, please. So the first agreement was signed and it, go, it went to what date? My understanding that it went to the end of the pandemic. Is that correct? The first it, yeah, it Yes, it doesn't go to a specific date. It's tied to the end of the state of emergency. So when the end of the state of emergency is lifted um, is, is what was put in that, uh, that agreement. 
Well, the governor still has a state of emergency. If that's what we signed, I think we need to think seriously about uh, doing what we said we would do. Thank you. Senator DeChambeau. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I'm gonna begin with words matter. Uh, as a state employee, I can see both sides of this really. I, but as a state employee, having worked in the Department of Corrections, I can well imagine how that they feel right now if the first uh, statement was made till the end of the state of emergency. I'm sure the correctional officers and the non-custodial staff hung their hat on that. And the state of emergency is still going. It doesn't help that a second edict goes out and says, oh, we can give you seven days notice. I'm not attacking you, Ms. Trundy. I just need to make the statement. Um, I also was interested, you use the word settle. Um, there is an ability therefore probably in a settlement and I, I don't know if I'm asking you to stick your neck out, but um, it would be the union. I mean, if this is so cost prohibitive, uh, but I think we owe something to the staff, there could be a settlement of a lump sum rather than go hour by hour or staff by staff. Is that a possibility that would be entertained? Yes, I think certainly it is a possibility that would be entertained. I, to speak to the, the fiscal question at this point in time, um, through, through FY, the end of FY21, we would estimate that the cost would be about 7.5 million um, for those, um, for those contracts that that originally had the um, had the end of the state of emergency uh, language, or I should say agreements, they're separate from the from the contract. Um, it, and then there are other agreements that are separate and aside from those with different groups of employees that had the seven the seven day notice language in them. Um, so the cost of the the per month cost is about 1.25 million. Mm -hmm. uh, follow up, um, just to follow that up. Um, so the 7.5 was just for corrections, right? Or did no, the that seven, include Dorothea Dix and others? Sorry for talking over you. Uh, the 7.5 uh, in, includes both, it includes corrections, DHHS, and the employees under DAFs that, okay. that also had that language. Um, corrections is the largest piece of it. Yeah. Well, I figured for corrections, it's about 5.5. So it wouldn't be surprising. Um, all right, thank you. I'm all set. Um, Representative Pickett and Senator DeChambeau, I'm going to hand the gavel back to you because I have to head to an appointment. So Representative Thank you. Pickett, yes, thank you. Um, Got to put my hand down. Okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Any Chair. Any other questions uh, for uh, Ms. Trundy? <laughs> yes, I have my hand up. Seeing none? I no had my hand question? up. I, she had just called on me when she gave you the gavel. Okay. Well, I didn't call on you, but go ahead there, <laughs> Representative. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that just keeps me confused because I'm confused of the testimony here, and I'm going to try to get unconfused. Uh, thank you. Ms. Trundy for being here this afternoon. So I was really right on top, I thought of what was going on here until when you were talking about, I think three different type, three different types of, of uh, you said one, one group of workers that was to the end of the pandemic, went to the end of the pandemic. And another one was at, uh, you, you, another group was because it was, at a different time or something. And that's where I'm getting confused. So 
instead of trying to explain it, because I'm excused, I can't even explain it properly. Is there anybody right now in state employed that is getting a stipend? No, not related okay. to not related to hazard pay. But, okay. But if you if you'd like representative, I can take one more shot at explaining it. There. I think I I think I I really do think okay. I understand now. I okay. just was I I just when you talked about the other the other the other two when you was talking there. I think when we was talking with uh, Representative Costain, I said. Well, does that mean, I thought to myself, does that mean there are some people that are getting it right now and some people that aren't, but that's not the case. And that's really all I need to know. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I, I've lowered my hand. Um, I really don't know who's next. I apologize. So it's Senator Searway, followed by Representative Costain. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. Trundy, I uh, got one question about, um, there was a time when uh, they were receiving hazard pay for weeks when they were not uh, taking in inmates from other areas. And then the county just held their inmates as the gov governor prohibited inmate transfer to state facilities. So uh, what, what, uh, what, Factor in was that as far as the hazard pay? I'm just trying to figure this out a little bit. Um, I don't know as it was a factor in the hazard pay agreements. What I think I might be able to provide to be helpful is the dates that the hazard pay agreements were executed, um, both those uh, uh, pertaining to corrections and then also pertaining to other, other groups of employees. So I was just thinking like in the hospitals, they didn't have any choice. The uh, patients come in and whatever, whereas, you know, it kind of halted whoever came in, went out. And, um, I know. mean, I guess what I would say to that is I think that that is one of the, you know, the, that's one of the safety measures that we took within the facilities um, to, to mitigate the spread of the virus. Right. You know, this was, it's a multi-pronged approach that certainly the, the hazard pay was a large a large piece of it, but um, we did still need people to come to come to their jobs, and so you know we also m made every effort to make them as safe as possible while they were reporting for their jobs. Yeah, thank you, Representative Costain. So I have two questions. One is, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, one would be. If, if you think about the first agreement you signed, these guys still should be getting paid right till now. The governor just signed another month order for to stay in the uh, state of emergency. So, so every every week or every month, we're occurring more and more and more uh, by being in this emergency. If if in fact in the end you go back to the first date, uh, is that correct? I, I'm not. I'm not sure that I can. I can say to that. I think what I want to do is take us back to December and the place and time that we were in at that moment when we when we made the decision to terminate the the hazard pay agreements. This was not something that we wanted to do, but at that moment in time, there had been no action from the United States Congress, and the CRF funds were due to expire on 12:30. We had done a very good job from the point, the point that we received the CRF funds until that point, trying to spend them completely um, so that there would be no unused CRF. Um, so we really, we, we really didn't think we had the financial resources. We are in a, a slightly different situation today than we were at that point in time. The, we've had several revenue reforecasts um, that have changed the financial picture of the state, but in December, it looked pretty, it looked pretty lean. Follow up, ma'am. Yes, go right ahead. So I guess my, my second question would be the county jails are in the same position as uh, a matter of fact, the county jails took inmates in, they had no choice to take inmates in. 
like our state jails. Okay, the state jails put a stop to it and said, we're not bringing anybody into our jail. You're not bringing anybody there. So my county jail, along with 15, 14 other county jails in the state, they're the ones that really were at risk. And those guys got nothing. Is there going to be any pass money from the state in to give these guys any back money that probably they, they're the ones that really deserve it? And I'm not saying that the state didn't deserve when they were in the same situation, but the county jails actually were the ones that were there through the whole pandemic and taking inmates in and no one else when, when none of our state jails did. Could you answer that? Yeah, I would say at this moment in time, there's nothing to require that. Um, you know, I think the state was very fortunate in its ability to provide hazard pay to its employees. I will tell you that we were, we were very rare in that. As we have talked to other states across the country, um, we are a real outlier. Most states did not provide hazard pay for state employees. Thank you. Ms. Trundy, uh, I have a question, a follow-up that Representative Kassane asked. Um, during the time that, and there, there was a dual reason why they asked that the prisoners who were arrested, sentenced, and awaiting transfer to a state prison, why they were held, and one was COVID, uh, to minimize uh, you know, prisoners coming from all over the state and congregating there. Um, the other one was construction. There were no beds. Uh, some of the buildings were torn down. So there was a dual thing going on in there. Um, I'm curious though, because I should know the answer to this. During the time that the Department of Corrections acting on behalf of the state said, um, Penobscot, Cumberland, York, keep the guys until we're ready to bring them in, the gals too. Were those county jails ever compensated day to day for the time they quote babysat those uh, prisoners or held? I, that's an old term I've been using, I'm sorry, it was babysitting, but uh, don't mean it in any derogatory way. It was just, so was the state reimbursing them since they really were state prisoners? I'm not aware of that happening, but I think that that's a question that would actually be better asked of uh, the Department of Corrections. Okay, thank you. I guess the answer is not, yeah. Okay. The, the answer is I don't know. <laughs> no, I, I, I wasn't sure, I was hoping, um, you know. Um, Representative Costain. I can answer, I believe, for my county, and they did not get reimbursed from the state. Okay. Well, we're going off. Thank you for that, Representative Custain. We're going off the, the subject title. And you've been very gracious, Ms. Trundy, just to answer the questions and keep a smiling face. Uh, <laughs> it, I, for a moment there, I felt like I was a sitting judge and having to make a tough decision here. Um, I missed the part, uh, Ms. Trundy, did we call you in as neither for nor against or against or what did we call you in on? You called me in as against. Against, okay. Uh, thank you. Any other questions of Ms. Trundy? Seeing none, thank you. I will ask if there's anybody in the attendees room that wishes to uh, testify in opposition of this bill. Please raise your hand, we'll let you in. Seeing none, Senator. Okay. And anyone uh, wishing to testify neither for nor against? Again, seeing none. Really? <laughs> really I'm surprised. Okay, thank you. Um, so having no other hands uh, raised, I would rule that this, uh, I can't remember the number, is it 1683? I don't even have the number here. Um, yes, yes, it is. I will, call, 
the public hearing of 1683 uh, closed. Thank you. Uh, we will be having a week from tomorrow, the 25th in the afternoon will be the work session. Um, did we ask if we needed any information from Ms. Overton? Jane, the, we didn't, there was nothing. So uh, we'll no. no, no, okay. I'm not drumming up any work for you, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so we've concluded as I can understand it, uh, our work session and our public hearing for the day. Is that correct? All right. I apologize for being late. I don't understand. I couldn't get through, but I want you to know I now will have my lunch. You'll be giggling about this. When I left here, I decided to go get a lunch since there's nothing in my refrigerator, but I couldn't go anywhere except across the street to the car wash since the seagulls found my car and I could not see through the window. So that's where my lunch was spent. So God, it's a bad day all around. <laughs> um, Ms. Fahey? Um, just a, a quick announcement. If everyone could um, watch for emails from Casey Milligan in legislative info office, um, bills can't move until you all sign off on them. Sorry, I'm disappearing. Um, and um, so there's one for LD 1052 now that needs everybody to sign off. 1052? Yes. Um, go ahead. You need to reply directly to Casey Milligan, not, not to me. Okay, to Casey. Um, Thank Am you. I putting you on the spot if I ask you how many divided reports we now have for Wednesday? Um, there's four more, so. Four more? Uh, well, yeah, there, there's four more. I don't know if they'll all make it onto the session schedule, but um, I'm gonna copy them just so that you have them in case they do. Yeah. So if we added those four, how many divided reports do we have? Seven, possibly eight. Yeah. Okay. And um, Jane, Ms. Overton. Hi. Um, we're starting tomorrow morning with a 10 o'clock briefing on the governor's change package. Yeah. Uh, there, I will... Um, I'll try to get that out to you, but I actually haven't been sent it. Uh, if you go on the Bureau of Budget website, there's an entry there for the change package. Uh, I think it's under LD221 change package. And there are some entries in the change package. There is some money being proposed to be spent or being moved both in Department of Corrections and Department of Public Safety. There, uh, and there may even be some in MEMA. Uh, and MEMA, I'll remind you, is in Department of Defense. Uh, so if you look for it in Public Safety, you won't find it. Um, I don't have any um, little shorthand documents or spreadsheets on it. I haven't been given a report sheet or anything. Okay. Uh, you said go on to Bureau of what? Bureau of the Budget. It's in DAFs. Okay. Uh, in DAFs, Bureau of Budget, and they have right on their uh, front page, you get into at this point, I think, there's an entry for the change package. Thank you. Uh, Representative Pickett? Yes, uh, Madam Chair. Now, we have uh, tomorrow morning, uh, I think Jane just said 10 o'clock. Is that 10 or 9? Because I see 9 on my on my schedule. I That, that was an error. It's I think it's 10. So it's 10 o'clock, not 9? Okay, yeah, thank yeah. you. And secondly, uh, if I seem to remember seeing something. Do we have, do we have two government budget change 
packages that we're going to be looking at. One that one that one that uh, is for public safety, and the other is for the Department of Corrections. Is that true, or are they all in one, or how's that going? It seems to me I, what the twenty fifth I thought was the second one. Oh uh, well, that's a good question. A uh, change package. It, there's one change package, um, but I would remind you that in that is the commissioners or directors are going to come tomorrow to present to you. Um, and on the 25th uh, at 10 o'clock, we're supposed to work the budget, the change package in the remaining items from the budget um, from, from the first budget. Uh, because Remember the one that it, there was a real packet for that with voting uh, lines on each sheet. So and the report did, that we never did. You did not finish, particularly the Department of Corrections. Correct. So no, it's I'm also sure. also an opportunity for you to finish the Department of Corrections, uh, and that would all be on Tuesday the twenty fifth and. Uh, we sort of need an extension on that because we're supposed to report that day at four, which really will not be possible if we're meeting in the morning. Uh, but it will also be very difficult to report that day at four if you haven't voted everything. And so, so the, the, uh, I was talking with someone from AFA today on the AFA committee today, and, and they were telling me that we were the only committee that has not reported, reported out our, our report to them. I, yeah, I don't think anybody has done the change package, but I think the, uh, I'm not aware there were any other committees that didn't complete their work on the initial biennial budget. That's what I mean on, on us. We had not, we had not, re the day we were down there, we had two, we had two proposals that we put in, but we didn't really talk any at all about any of our initiatives or anything else that we did at that time, if I, if I recall. And then that was the day that they called the, uh, the, the, the my majority budget and that whole thing went into effect. So that's going to be all taken care of then on tomorrow and the 25th, and then maybe even after that, if we need to. Uh, I, uh, I certainly did not say after that. Okay, so <laughs> tomorrow and the, and the 25th then. Well, I can't say you can't do it after that, but I have no authority with- I know. <laughs> other than to say the 25th. Thank you, Esther. Well, it's been one of those kind of years, we all know it, so well, <laughs> we just gotta grin and bear it and make it through the best we can. Thank you. Representative Pickett and, and Ms. Overton, um, correct me if I'm wrong, some if not all the reasons we didn't complete it is this committee has bills of um, closing, uh, take, you know, there was a bill about 50% of MDA, we didn't know where that was going, and then closing MIAC and and this, and now it, we've got two outstanding bills having to do with Lawn Creek or juveniles. So uh, it's really fluid, I would think. Uh, we don't know if we have it or we don't have it. But tomorrow we'll be listening to the commissioner present to us his plan. Uh, and it should look a little clearer anyways, and we can respond to that. Uh, did you put your hand back up or not? didn't put it down okay representative Fluker. i just wanted to be clear we are not meeting until 10 tomorrow is that true yes i believe that's yeah okay thank you One of the reasons. right we're all set for 10 o'clock tomorrow thank you very much um and this concludes our day um with um or our afternoon with public hearings see you all tomorrow and then we can rest on 19, right? No. <laughs> See ya. Bye-bye.